Hello Survivors and welcome to First Aid Spray, a Resident Evil podcast by fans for fans. This is episode 65 of the show and in this edition we put on our safety goggles and lab coats in the first episode of a study on viruses. This is Virology T-Virus. My name is Sai and joining me on the panel this week, if you were infected with the T-Virus, he'd be at your bedside with chicken soup. It's Fire Button's Steve Valance. Yeah, no, wouldn't it's awful. Hi everybody. <laughs> If you're infected with the T-Virus, he'd be at your bedside with honey and lemon tea. It's Moist Dowlet, a.k.a. James. And with a little bit of brandy in there as well. Ooh, I like it. And our special guest this week, if you were infected with the T-Virus, he'd tell you to be thankful it isn't a cordyceps fungal infection. It's AK Black and Red, a.k.a. Phil Dickens. That's fairly accurate. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Every episode of First Aid Spray is recorded live on our Discord server, so join now to hear the show early and unedited and to become part of our fantastic little community where we discuss life, the universe, and Resident Evil. You can find a link to the server as well as our social media profiles at our website, fasprayPod.com. It's the support of our listeners that keeps First Aid Spray going, so why not check out our merchandise or our Patreon page? Tears begin at just $1 a month. Head over to patreon.com forward slash fasprayPod pod for a full list and the chance to create bonus first aid spray content speaking of which special thank you to our latest patreon the fifth survivor thank you to the fifth survivor thank you to all of our patrons for your continued patronage uh, we have a few patron exclusives that have gone up between now and the previous episode the new episode of tear death experience saw us ranking the iconic locations in Resident Evil across the years. It is a bumper edition of the episode. It's the longest episode of the series so far, uh, but I promise the discussion gets deep. It's it's incredible. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed just watching it through for the edit, to be honest. We also uh, put out a YouTube video, which is accessible via our secret Patreon back room for our wishlist episode of RE4 Remake, of course. So if you want to see, you know, our YouTube content early, make sure you're in there. Uh, meanwhile, over on our YouTube, we dropped a sort of unboxing review of Laced Records Resident Evil 1 vinyl release, the special edition of the 1996 soundtrack. Shout out to Laced for retweeting that as well. We appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, if you like looking at pretty vinyl things, then do recommend um, and speaking of music, the latest episode of Now That's What I Call Survival Horror is out and it's a double disc edition on RE Survivor and Dead Aim featuring myself and Jordan. Uh, so yes, lots going on, more to look forward to, of course. Uh, but let's circle back round to our guest, Phil. Welcome to the show. First Thanks. questions first. What was your first sort of introduction to Resident Evil? Where did you start and you know how did you fall in love with it? Um, so the first one that I played was Resident Evil 2, the original, way back in uh, 1998, that one came out, if I remember correctly. Yes. Um, yeah. So originally, like before I had a PlayStation, my mate had one, and it was one of those classic experiences of, you know, sort of sitting in your friend's bedroom and you're sort of taking turns and like watching them play and you're like, oh, can I have a go yet? Um, but <laughs> then, like once I got it, I just absolutely fell in love with that game and it there's something about like that sort of early era of gaming and, and it always being the second in a series that I, I joined with because it was Resident Evil 2, Doom Raider 2, Sonic 2. It was They were all the, the first introduction to those series. But yeah, that was the one that um, got me and reeled me in and been a huge Resi fan ever since. There is something to be said about you know, people talk about the curse of sequels, but there are plenty, you're right, there are plenty of amazing video game sequels. I guess in general, but especially that era and you know those series that you just listed i mean there are definitely some that don't live up to the potential even from that era but yeah it's, it's a fair point um so you uh have your own channel obviously where you cover horror resident evil and you know the last of us quite prominently right now um i guess basically this is a chance to sort of plug that i suppose um yeah so um my channel is the same as the username i have everywhere else ak black and red which is obviously not keeping in with the brand because it has nothing to do with horror or Resident Evil or Last of Us. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm talking about a lot about The Last of Us at the moment because we've got the, the show on at the moment and I've been running um, permadeath challenges on the games. But we've also got... Um, there'll be a lot more coverage coming up with Resident Evil when the, the remake of 4 drops. Mm. So um, yeah, that that's pretty much the, everything with the channel. It's 
it's quite exciting because I'm, I'm getting closer to a thousand subscribers now, so I can get that sweet, sweet YouTube monetization. But ah, oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> in that case, link is in the description wherever you're listening to this. Go subscribe to Phil uh, and check out you know his channel. And especially if you're a Last of Us fan with the TV show going on right now, which I literally just finished this week's episode and it was pretty great. Uh, so yeah, there's, you know, I see you putting out content for that all the time, which I thoroughly enjoy. So I'm excited to see what you do for RE4R. And also, it's worth mentioning that you did, um, with Will from Resident Evil Central, Horror Game of the Year last year. You know, thankful for you featuring us on that. So a quick plug, of course, for that. Uh, hopefully we'll see that again from you guys at the end of this year, beginning of next year. Is that the plan? Yeah, I think we'll we'll start planning it a bit earlier next year because it was just kind of a, um, well, it started life basically as a brain fart because I decided, why is why are, um, the Game Awards, it was the, when they announced the nominations and there was nothing, like mm. Signalis had been the big one everyone was raving about, it, myself included, and then never even got a look in because everything was Elden Ring or God of War and it was just like, yeah, we need to do our own thing if we want to get horror games more recognition. So, uh, that's yeah, what we do. I, it's really cool, and obviously you guys brought together a lot of content creators, so that's always nice to see. Uh, but, cool, let's move into uh, another meaty edition, to some degrees, of the Biohazard News. Steve, would you like to take us away? That's the jingle played? I hope the jingle's played. Uh, right, okay, so our first news story, Resident Evil 4 2023 has got yet another trailer at the PlayStation State of Play in February. Allegedly there is a demo out shortly. Um, I don't know, I haven't watched it. <laughs> Do you know, I feel like, and I might even just have to pull it up now, I it's all blurs together at this point. Like, There's so much coming out. And I feel like if you went back through show history, we probably said that every time on the lead up to a new game in the last five years. But they've really ramped up putting out stuff. I don't remember what was part of what trailer, but yes, unfortunately, awkwardly, uh, we are recording this just a few days away from when the demo is expected to drop. Um, well, there's meant to be a Capcom showcase coming up, so we can probably expect it to follow on from that. I mean, the game is out in two or so weeks, so it's coming very soon. Uh, so we will try and cover the demo in another episode. Uh, but yeah, James, how are you feeling about, you know... The output of RE for our stuff, you know, not just the stuff we've seen, but also the rate that it's coming out now. Yeah, it's kind of it's disappointed me a little bit because I was very excited for there actually to be hardly any information told. Mm. Um, I was expecting there to be a lot of information told about the first part of the game, just like the original release was, um, and then it was just going to be left there. But we've been given quite a lot of information, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it because it's, it's Steve. We've got Steve here and other folks who listen in, but. They've shown so much that it's... I mean, they have left some things in the dark. Right. But they've shown so off so much that it's... Yeah, it's kind of take... It's taken off my... It's, bring, it's brung my like my, my hype down a little bit. But I'm still, like, very excited to play the game. It's It that still looks great, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it's just a very weird decision, a weird way to go, direction to go after Village. The worst part is, uh, I, there's a part, there's a small part of the back of my brain that's going, ask James questions. When I can just watch the trailer. So I, I am excited. <laughs> also, I get the feeling that, uh, am I right in thinking that most of the surprises, if you played the original RE4, have like kind of evaporated at this point? Or... Um, I wouldn't. Some of it. I don't know about all. It's hard to yeah. say, isn't it? Because RE4, we talked about this a little bit in the Wishlist episode, so it's kind of a spoiler, I suppose. But. The RE4 is a massive game, so they couldn't possibly show all of it in a trailer if they tried. But yeah, it's a it's a a, a good breadth of stuff. Fair yeah, it's, it's like you know, it, it's it's just a lot of like uh, like hit, like well, like clip bait kind of stuff. You know, um, looks good in the trailer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it, and it's just like oh, so that's in it now. That's in it. That's in it. That's in it. You know, um, but there are some new stuff new things that have been all seemingly they look new because they might just be in hd and like now <laughs> we now i can't like make the the differentiation but yeah uh hype is still high I just yeah i just wish it wasn't they just weren't showing as much really yeah it's kind of hard because we you know our crew does certain amounts of spoiling themselves and you know i don't force anyone to watch stuff who doesn't want to but you know considering that we try and cover this stuff 
it is like okay I'd, I'd rather yeah. just be done and <laughs> I'm ready and, now I'm ready just you don't have to keep showing us more yeah and like Steve said it uh, you know recent, like on Wishlist it was like sorry not Wishlist on yeah but it was like you're gonna get spoiled anyway because somebody's gonna tag you in it like or somebody yeah. you know yeah. or somebody's gonna like oh did you hear about this you know um <laughs> that's like that's how I always used to be spoiled with Game of Thrones stuff. Is like someone would come mm. into my DMs. And go, Did you hear about this? And this happened. And this person died. And then you know, and like I didn't ask for that information. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil, how are you feeling about the lead up to remake four? And where's your hype at? I'm I'm actually I think still very excited for it. But I've also like I've watched the trailers when they've come out. But all the sort of extra stuff that GameSpot had, where they were doing like full gameplay, I've deliberately avoided that because of the like. Mm. No, I, I can see it enough from the trailers, and they they are releasing a lot. Um, but I I want to experience the rest of it myself. Like a demo is a different thing because you're kind of choosing that experience. Yeah. But it when you kind of like right here's basically several hours worth of content on a game that's not even out yet, and it's like. Hmm. Mm, I, I, I want to have that experience when I've got a controller in my hand and see what it's like for myself. Do we know yeah, if it's going to so be like a time-limited thing or...? We don't know anything about the demo other than it's called a special demo, which could mean literally everything or nothing. Who even knows what it is? Um, <laughs> I I expected a slice of the prey blow. That's the most easy assumption to make, but I have not a clue. Fair enough. Uh, I, I, there is a small part of me that if they do do a demo, I hope it's more of a law building one. I know there wasn't a lot in Maiden, but the idea that that yeah. added on stuff, even if it was just basically, here's Ingrid, they're cadaverific now. Uh, you know, <laughs> it was something. <laughs> when, when, they, yeah. when they announced the trailer, again, I don't want to spoil anything. But when they it, they didn't go into the the scene where I know this is I'm basically picking holes here, but they didn't like go to the scene of game, demo coming now immediately. Prior to that, they had a couple of scenes of gameplay footage saying demo coming soon, and it was of a particular part of uh, the early game. Ah. So I don't know if they were like kind of spoiling or well, not really spoiling, but kind of teasing you with where that was going. Um, mm. I'll just say hallway. Um, like for that one, um, but okay. I mean, there are many hallways in RE4, but <laughs> like, you know, it was, there's a very, there's a very famous hallway. And I remember right. seeing that scene and thinking, oh, is it going to be like a little kind of similar to Maiden? Is it going to be a, like a little adventure through there? But, uh, yeah, from what I saw, it was definitely Leon, but I mean, I'm just theorizing it could, could just mm. be, you know, them just teasing more stuff because they wanted to cram so much in. The worst part I is... Don't... James says the word hallway, and I'm just going, what famous hallway in RE4? Is it the one where you're going through a load of water? Is it the one with the flowing curtains? And again, it's like Steve just watched the trailer. And <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I feel like this is probably a game that isn't going to get one of those yeah village-style demos where it sort of tacks on or you know approaches it in a different way. I feel like it will just be more of a vertical, like, like three makes, which is just like, here's that portion of the game. Uh, but I'm willing to be wrong. I'd love to be wrong, but I don't see it personally. Yeah, the Maiden one was like a lot further away than the, the full kind of castle and village demo we got, which I think yeah, was Yeah, it was like six months out. And that was because um, yeah. they did, they had to do something. They did something. It was like a PS5 exclusive and didn't do it anywhere mm. else. So I'd be surprised if they do something like that. I, I was more thinking because they kind of built village sort of in that sort of vein of obviously that's where they were going with for remake as well and um, will we get the same like parallel areas to where we got in the, the village demo mm. just outside the castle type thing mm. but well i don't know yeah i don't know all we can really do is speculate and we'll literally find out in a couple of days i suppose so all the same okay so our next new story it's actually pretty fantastic in my opinion. Resident Evil 5 on PC has gotten a major update removing its Games for Windows Live integration. So I don't... I can't pretend that I know too much about what Games for Windows Live was supposed to be or what it is. What I know in this instance is that RE5 is now playable with offline co-op on PC for the first... not Maybe not the first time, but for the first time in a long time at least. Um... 
but I do know that the games for Windows Live service is kind of a curse upon many games. For example, we tried booting up Operation Raccoon City to play it together and you can't even get the game to load at all because of Windows Live game service, whatever this is. So I will say the same thing about this that I said on Twitter as soon as this news came out was, okay, cool, now do it for Raccoon City, please. But uh, overall, yes, this is good news. James, do you know anything about this game for Windows Live stuff? You're the the PC gamer. Uh, I don't... (laughs) <laughs> no, um, I, I I like have I haven't really played RE5 on the PC, so I haven't really mm. ventured into it to see. But I mean, Windows Live is is an absolute bane of our existence and has been like for like over a decade now. It's I remember um, I was playing, I was trying to play naturally on brand. I was trying to play an Alien game. I remember, <laughs> and like it was absolute hell to get play. To this was back in like 2012, I think. It was absolutely mm-hmm. hell to get it working. It was just a pain in the butt. Like they were trying to sell it as like, this client where you could. It's kind of like P, you know, P at the PlayStation, like achievement system and stuff. Like Steam right, has okay. and that, right? But yeah, and they tried, and then like the whole DRM thing became that. That was the real reason we had Windows Live. Mm. Um, yeah, generally, so, but, it's the Xbox counterpart the xbox live counterpart is windows live or it was yeah. i think it's now xbox play anywhere oh, um, yeah. which and means like, any online service that would use it is now gone and therefore you're <laughs> trying to hook into thing that doesn't exist anymore i think that's what you're trying to get to right james yeah yeah exactly you're right like completely right and it's just a pain in the butt but you just it was just really awful to use and it was clunky as hell and at the same time, like I, I was used to the Xbox Live uh, system as well on the 360 at the time as well. Well, mm. way before that, really. Um, so that was like my previous experience with it. And even then, it was clunky and just could not use. So it was clunky when it was about, and ever since it's gone down, it's just come like a blockade. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been seems. this. It's just been so this like great. yeah. It's just been this ball and chain, just constant mm. pain in gamers' butts. I mean, in RE5's well, case, it's a weird situation anyway, because it was generally, you could still play online with friends, but I think that was more using Steam's client service as opposed to, uh, yeah. you know, but um, Operation Raccoon City and I believe like Lost Planet 2 and a few other great gems were completely, uh, you know, the second you boot it up, it tries to access a service that doesn't exist. So yeah. if they can remove that integration in those games specifically, or Lost Planet 2 maybe, because that's like, you know, a fantastic little game. Um it's going to go down well. I feel like this is a stepping stone to great things if they follow through with it. Hopefully, the peop- the fans have been vocal but not annoying enough to maybe give it that nudge. <laughs> mm. It's quite a surprise. Like I didn't see this coming at all. Um, timing wise, it's really weird. Like it's just dropped randomly. Like this is a thing. Um, but it is nice. Like it's good. And hopefully, this is the beginning of this happening across more Capcom games and hopefully more games in general. It is really weird, isn't it, Sai? That it would happen. Just before Remake 4 comes out. <laughs> don't, don't go there. <laughs> uh, Phil, have you had any encounters with this game for Windows Live thing, or are you purely console? Uh, no, if I try and play um, games on my computer, the game laughs at me, so I just stick to console. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I can I can relate with that somewhat. I can I can uh, recommend a service to you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Well, okay, let's uh, let's pack the news away and get into the very first episode of Virology, which is covering the T-Virus. And now, reprising his role as James Marcus to read the file Leech Growth Records from Resident Evil Zero, Sam Rowett, who you can follow on Twitter, at Sam Rowett Games. February 3rd. 1978. Administered tea into four leeches. Their will to survive leads them first to parasitism and predation, then they breed and multiply. Such a single-minded biology makes them attractive candidates for bioweapons research. Afterwards, no major changes observed. February 10th, 1978. Seven days since administration of T, rapid growth to double former size, signs of transformation emerging, spawning successful. 
They double their numbers in one hour, but their ravenous appetites lead them to cannibalism. Hasten to increase food supply, but lost two. March 7th, 1978. Provided them with live feed, but lost half when the live food fought back. However, the leeches are learning from experience, and are beginning to exhibit group attack behavior. They are also ceasing cannibalism. Their evolution is exceeding expectations. So, we've not particularly done a lot of lore-based episodes of the show. Um, I suppose Profile is the closest we've got where we talk about character histories. Um, but with Profile sort of coming to a close and we're nearly done with Book Club, um, it felt sort of prudent that we have a new series of podcasts. And we should also, you know, sort of mirroring that, is talk about the enemies, the monsters, the BOWs, and also specifically the viral agents that create them. Um, so this is kicking off a brand new series, and as always with a brand new series, it feels a little bit like shaky ground, but uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll do great. So we're going to talk about T-Virus, the backstory in the game, how we feel about it, um, how do we feel about the BOWs, and so on and so forth. I want to do a shout out, since it's a lore episode, to our friends over at the Resident Evil podcast or ResidentEvilPodcast.com. Um, of course, we've used their timeline in the past, and now they have the encyclopedia section, so it makes it even easier to look up specific Resident Evil, well, everything, really, characters, monsters, viruses. So a lot of the reading that I'll be doing from this to bring us to our points of discussion are pretty much just direct from their encyclopedia. So again, shout out to those guys and the incredible work they do. Um, so let's just, uh, I'll tee us up with at least some background on the creation of the T-Virus. Um, Umbrella founder, one of three, as we know, James Marcus, created the first successful T-Virus in September 1977 by combining the progenitor virus, which we'll talk about also in this episode, with leech DNA. Selective breeding showed the virus reacted favorably with single-minded organisms and kept the specimens alive in a clinically dead state whilst mutating and becoming violent and aggressive. He then conducted further research on insects, amphibians and mammalians and evaluated the various differing effects on each species classification, eventually determining that mammals reacted the most favorably because of their naturally higher intelligence and notable increased muscle growth. He soon concluded that the virus could never be properly developed without using humans as the base organism. This led Marcus to experimenting on company trainees as test subjects, a move that ultimately cost him his job and saw him removed from power. The prototype T-virus strain was eventually stolen and exploited by Albert Wesker and William Birkin under the orders of Oswell Spencer. Using Marcus's work as a template, Birkin engineered various other strains of the T-virus that eventually led to the creation of the Tyrant, the ultimate human biological weapon. After exposure, the virus will spread around a subject's body, inserting its own genetic coding into the cells of the host, absorbing, their viral, absorbing the viral genome in its own genetic makeup, which then takes over the cell's functions. The cell begins to produce offspring of the original virus, self-propagating by using the synthesis properties and energy of proteins. Other things of note, of course, all organisms are capable of being infected by the T-virus to some degree, which is what makes it such a... Alluring is perhaps the wrong word, but uh, alluring prospect. Uh, but the virus has a capped 90% infection rate with humans just simply because of the unpredictable element of the human genome. And almost all infected specimens display eroded intelligence, making certain infections extremely difficult to train as weapons. So let's talk about the T-virus. Um, how do we feel about the T-virus in the series? I guess more before that, you know... Our exposure to zombie media over the years, you know, it's not always viral agents. Sometimes it's simply supernatural stuff, zombies coming out of their graves. Uh, Resident Evil as a series, there are a couple of moments where zombies come out of their graves, admittedly. But it's not really about, you know, classic zombies coming out of the cemetery or even going further back where it's sort of zombie voodoo. Um, so I guess my, my first question is, how do we feel, or how did we feel in the early days when we were experiencing... Uh, zombies via viral agents. Steve, do you remember uh, your reaction to this at the time, or did it just feel kind of like, yeah, that makes sense, yeah, science over supernatural? 
I, I'm going to be real. Like, yeah, at the time, I thought it was neat and cool, and I kind of still feel it's neat and cool. Like, you know, that inner 10 year old, like, oh, wow, it's a. It's a, it's a man-made thing that does this. Like, because, you know, Jurassic mm. Park at the time is all like, oh, yeah, take the amber and just shove a bit of frog DNA in. Whoa, dinosaurs. <laughs> it's the same kind of logic for me. And I, I love the fact that, yeah, just give them a shot of the T-virus and woohoo! Man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic in that regard. I, mm. As a general storyline catalyst, this is probably a little bit before the horses but before uh, Mr. Sunglasses Man came back and covered Veronica to me I always thought T-Virus is the the real threat and the most interesting thing about the whole series mm. so yeah I, I was kind of very much on board with the idea of viral agents even as a young whippersnapper yeah it's um I will often defend, so people sometimes will come to me to talk about, you know, whatever they're watching and there'll be a piece of backstory that doesn't get explained, that they're adamant that, you know, they show or the film has made a mistake and we need to know about this. Depending on the context, of course, sometimes it's relevant to say, well, that's what makes it scary is the not knowing, right? And that is part of... We look at George A. Romero's zombies. Um, I haven't necessarily watched all of his films, and maybe I missed something in there, but they don't ever really get to the bottom of really quite what set it off, at least in the early films. It's just kind of, they're here now. We don't know why. You deal with it. Uh, which, obviously, it can be an appeal of zombies. Um, but having had exposure to those films a little bit earlier on, before I played Resident Evil, I agree in the sense that it is nice to have both ends, you know, have cake and eat it to have this really interesting origin of the zombies and the rest of the monsters in the series by having them created by just awful scientists <laughs> cooked up in a lab somewhere so i agree uh phil how do you feel about you know the origins of the t-virus you know and the use of viral agents in resident evil yeah well i mean as a kid it was very much the same sort of thing of like ooh, zombies this is cool um mm. but Thinking that, like, say, the more I've kind of thought critically about it and stuff, and certainly been more obsessive about it, I suppose, as I got got older, um, I think we've got a bit of the not knowing in terms of like when you very first get into the games and you're sort of this has all happened and you don't know why until you kind of right. unravel the mystery of whatever particular mm. story you're playing. So there's kind of both ends of that, but it it also feeds into this whole thing of because zombie stories. In whether it's George A. Romero or Resident Evil, it, it's they're basically reflecting various sorts of societal fears and stuff out there. And in the Resident Evil case, it's you know what the sinister corporations dumping in your backyard in a small town, and mm. the, it's it's kind of when you unravel that mystery, it's like all these monstrosities and these things come out. And then once you get the T virus, that's the kind of the symbol that actually it's you know. I, I, was there a specific line at the end of RE3 remake that basically said this explicitly, but it was all caused by human greed in the end and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, so that kind of it almost gives the more human, less supernatural end to it because it says actually, you know, it was the scientists, it was the corporation that was behind this, not, you know, monsters rising from the pits of hell or whatever <laughs> other explanation we might get. Right. Yeah. yeah, I like, you know, your point about reflections of fears in society it makes me think of not romero specifically i think i might have mentioned this series before sometime on the show but uh return of the living dead which is kind of a goofy series of zombie films but uh the origin of that is you know radioactive spills and that kind of thing which again speaks to a part in our history about you know the fear of nuclear power and radiation and all that kind of stuff um but yeah resident evil for me was the first time i experienced it where it was twisted into Yes, you know, this is via mad science. But whilst the zombies in the series, you're quite right in saying, sort of implying there, that we find out actually the zombies specifically aren't manufactured on purpose, but everything else certainly was. Uh, James, how do you feel about Resident Evil's use of viruses? Um, is that what sets it apart from a lot of zombie media, at least the stuff that came before it? I think so, yeah. I also think that it's, it was easy. And I, I mean that in the best way possible. Mm. Um, like it, it was an easy narrative point to use, um, like working with something that <laughs> the majority of the population doesn't fully understand how it works, but know just enough to make uh, like anything attached to it fair game. Um, and that was kind of like a stroke of genius 
uh, for that. Because it's like, you know, everybody knows what viruses are and they know how they kind of work. So, you know, you you can insert anything that people are familiar with in the world of viro virology and then slap some fancy words on it, <laughs> as they have many in mm. in uh, regard to Resident Evil. And there, it's done. And that's not like a criticism. That's, you know, it's something that if you're trying to create a story from nothing, I always say to people when it comes to my, like me, well building and creating new worlds uh, in D and D, I always say that you need to start small, um, and then build yeah. out. Um, do not try and start big, and that's what Capcom did with Resident Evil. They started small. They started in a mansion, and mm. they started with the zombie, and then they just went out from there. And I think that is. Yeah, I think everybody else has hit the nails on the head in terms of points, but yeah, that that's my point with it. Is that it was a it was a very easy but very cool and genius thing to do um, because everybody could follow it. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, viruses. We when we you know as Resident Evil fans use the word virus, this is the kind of thing that concocts. But of course, viruses can just be cold, the flu. Yeah. something more intense you know we've just gone through a few years ago a rather major pandemic so the fear of infection of any kind just ebbs and flows throughout history you know we've we have a history as a human race of plagues and stuff like that so again it feeds it feeds into that and you're right you know it's quite simple to look at that and be like what if that but it was created as a result of something much worse this sort of human greed um yeah, the, the we we've also seen it happen, like <laughs> in the real world during this pandemic, mm. we've seen that happen. Um, mm. We've seen it like before our very eyes, and we've seen it prior before this as well with other pandemics as well and epidemics. Um, mm. The greed of these companies, like that are in the real world, is quite evident. Um, so yeah, they they're really hitting on something here, and <clears throat> like I am always. Uh, in support of basically uh, kind of pushing, uh, like say, just saying, you know, feck you to like companies and stuff uh, when it comes to this kind of like, when it comes to human lives. And this this series really touches on that when it comes to the viruses. Um, it really wants you to connect to these characters, and we do, and we have, we all have, and I think that's a really huge part of why we connect to the characters so much because of that. Yeah, there's something innate about it, isn't there? Rather than the sort of spooky, scary otherness, it's uh, the potential to of devastation via virus and this kind of thing is sort of within all of us. It's something that you can't necessarily got no control over. Yeah. Um, so I guess yeah, again, it speaks into that. Um, so in terms of the T virus, obviously, uh, and Phil, you quite rightfully said, sort of unwrapping the mystery uh, of the first game as you come to learn near the end, the T virus is essentially created to create biological weapons. Uh, that's what we find out at the end of Resident Evil 1. The zombies, um, more so addressed later, but not really intended for any particular use, just kind of a byproduct of the pursuit of the tyrant. Anything else that they can stick this virus into just to see what happens, I guess. Um, so the T-virus, again, and this actually... I feel like what's really interesting about this compared to most zombie media is it's just straight up zombie media. Whereas the zombies in this are just kind of like, eh, they're a thing. But it's more about the other monsters. The T-virus is more important in terms of creating these bigger, badder beasties. And the zombies are just kind of whatever. Um, Phil, how do you feel about the T-virus and its intentions? You know, it's, it's not created to create zombies. It's created to create something much worse. Yeah, it it is. Although um, thinking on that point and like the, the zombies being a byproduct, it's kind of inevitable in a way because the point of a mm. virus, any whether it's you know the T virus, the plague, COVID, whatever else, it wants to recreate and you know spread like like all life forms. And obviously, there's not really a way. Like once you've got a tyrant, we've not seen anything except for the G-Virus tyrant with the uh, embryos that William Birkin tries to implant in his daughter. Mm. But they don't try and infect other people and turn them in. They just kill in machines. Same with the hunters, same with the lickers. They don't really like yeah. procreate as such. So it, it was almost like the, the scientists, there. they've got their goal. They want to create this ultimate bioweapon. Um, but the virus has kind of gone, well, I still need to spread. I still need to reproduce. So... 
this is the way mm. I'll do it. I'll create these zombies because they can fight and they can pass on and I can still do my thing as a virus. It's really, really interesting point, actually. Yeah, so, yeah, it's almost like a dichotomy there of the in intended use by umbrella of the T-virus opposed to what the T-virus kind of, if you like, wants. Um, Steve, how do you feel about the T-virus as the sort of biological weaponry, that sort of angle? See, I, I've always seen it as like, you know, um, to, to coin a phrase, the Powerpuff Girls do the whole, like, you know, sugar, spice, everything nice, and then chemical <laughs> X, you know. Uh, the T-virus always felt like the first uh, in, a, in a long line of uh, chemical Xs, you know, the, the, the magical mystery glue that puts, uh, you know, mammalian DNA and reptilian-style DNA and boom, here's a hunter. Like, you know, that, that, mm. that chimeric glue. And the fact that in the process of using this, uh, if it's if the chemical were to spill or, you know, get out and spread, it produces, like, zombies and all manner of other, like, you know, secondary infectant mutations and, in, like, even creatures that weren't intended for it. Like, you know, look at Outbreak File 2's elephant, for example. Mm. Which has developed a bit, of, uh, you know, mutated sharp tusks, a taste for human flesh and, like, you know, lesions all across its body. It's... It's kind of wild what it can do, and the fact that it's so easy to use in terms of in in, in the real world universe, and that most things can be affected by it, is terrifying. And the fact yeah. that it's not even its intended purpose. You know, its purpose is literally to manufacture just more killing machines, more refined, controlled weapons, and yet it's just as deadly without that need. It's. Uh, mm. you know, bit strange for umbrella to focus more on making these products when they're just like yeah just chuck a t-virus in there that will sort that problem right out as a <laughs> as a set as a saleable weapon which it does sort of eventually end up as so at least it feels like it does mm. it speaks to me about sort of i guess the ego of umbrella that they would use something like this to create these weapons knowing full well or at least they should figure it out pretty quickly. They're meant to be pretty clever, these scientists, that it can <laughs> spread to every living thing. Uh, so the tiniest spill. And of course, we have to have some suspension of disbelief. Because if there is, you know, if Resident Evil is the real world, one T-virus spill is all it takes and we're all doomed. Because every single ant would have it. Uh, which obviously not necessarily how it works in the games. But the fact that, yeah, it could get out and we see it get out and local you know, fauna and f even flora becomes infected. Uh, it's pretty nuts. And yeah, it speaks to Umbrella just being like, cool, we want to make a bunch of weapons to make a bunch of money so we can pursue our actual goals, which again, we'll get to. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous when the, the risk of that, of it going terribly wrong is so high, which of course it inevitably does. Uh, yeah. James, how do you feel about uh, T-Virus as a weapon? I'm so happy that you guys brought up kind of just basically talking about Umbrella themselves because yeah, I want to talk about the characters that created this mm. um, because like the intentions of it in the first place, in my opinion, was a bit of a power fantasy from young scientists, um, you know, in Spencer and Marcus. I don't really count uh, Alexander like <laughs> all that much, but he's still part of the process. But, right. you know... They had this power fantasy, young scientists, they wanted to help the human race or become gods, mm -hmm. like, of when they began the process, you know, and you get, there's the foreshadowing in, uh, in material from RE5 that tells of, like, people that were considered gods, that mm -hmm. were immune to this infection, uh, from, we're going to talk about what that is in the next section, but... Yeah, so maybe Spencer and Marx's initial idea was uh, quite innocent um, when it comes to the T-virus. But, you know, eventually, uh, because of greed, again, we're going to keep saying that, but because of greed and uh, power and in all essence, an evil nature, um, mm. they want to become go gods. Um, we know that at the end of their lives, they wanted that, um, you know, Spencer, particularly Spencer, yeah, yeah, talks about it, yeah. and I mean, if you play RE Zero, Marcus is pretty much thinks they're a bloody god in that game. <laughs> it's commanding <laughs> leeches everywhere and going full Sephiroth. Um, but yeah, I, I think they lied to each other on what their eventual goals were. Um, I think it was a. This is why I want some kind of prequel 
uh, between what happens between between the three guys, yeah, yeah, we, well, between we what happens so between Miranda and nineteen sixty mm. something. Um, mm. You're yeah, up to I'm, a Resident I'm, Evil zero zero where Bravo <laughs> teams show up and still aren't in it. <laughs> well, it, it would give us so much information, and like I want to know because we've done so well with characterization. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going off. Um, mm. But yeah, I like, you know, as young scientists coming into the world, wanting to change uh, the world. Um, it's easy to think that they may have had like a semblance of good intention um, with creating this virus, but that I think was quickly forgotten when they realized the potential, a uh, personal potential for themselves. Mm. I think actually this is a good time to go on that tangent a little bit. Uh, I'd be interested to hear everyone's input on this. But, you know, you raise some very good points there. In terms of Marcus and how he viewed himself, it's hard to say because obviously this sort of pomp and circumstance is this weird... I mean, it's the Queen Leech. It's not actually Marcus. It's got Marcus's memories and emotions in there. So it's tough to say, you know, what's coming through there, where that comes from. So I can totally believe that maybe that's Marcus's truth coming through there, that he maybe wouldn't even admit to himself. I actually quite like that as a headcanon, certainly. But yeah, he was just this dude obsessed with what he was doing. Spencer, you're right, just fell into this ego trip. And, you know, Ashford, I feel like we don't know a whole lot about his contribution. Yeah. So yes, I would, I would love more between them and you know now we have Miranda involved in it as well so absolutely tie it all together a little bit more it was interesting actually because you said about you know maybe using it for good but there's a weird thing and this isn't even necessarily in my show notes that was going to cover this but there's a strain of the t-virus that was designed to essentially look into curing cancer and no other alternative you know ulterior motive as far as I know uh this was just something they were like okay then maybe it can do this um, so that's really weird. It doesn't necessarily fit in with the rest of it. Not a bad way. It's just, it's just odd that maybe they were trying everything, and maybe we only know <laughs> their evil experiments because that's what's important. Um, Steve, do you think there was ever good intentions for the T virus? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, um, there are positive applications for it. Like uh, mm. I believe that there's general skirting bits of various law of it being a, reju- a healing rejuvenating agent some even think it might be a part of the first aid spray itself right mm. and uh, i i still like from my perspective i was always under the intention that the, the t-virus is at least from spencer's pov more of a means to an end like he wants to get progenitor humans serving under him and glass yeah. everyone else in some way shape or form and the T virus, be it through monetary gain by selling weapons or killing people outright, or you know making money through the court cure, is all to basically end his end game process. Is still still kill everyone except for people who become super progenitor humans. But I'm at the top of the pyramid because I'm a nutcase. Like, <laughs> uh, in that regard, it's mm. terrifying in that yes, uh, there are potential positive applications for T, like. I am sure it's in one of like the outbreak games that there's like something about some like a, a file or a document that's like just a, a pass away note about how this this little extra bit can actually be used to regenerate dead cell, re- regenerate dead cells and mm. not damage the body. I think this is the whole thrust of like one of the movies as well. They use it in the marketing, don't they? Like regenerate. It lets you have youth more useful skin and then they become a uh, monster and bite the camera. Yes. Or whatever the yep. But it's the same concept either way. Um, so interacting with death, I think, seems to be the main core thrust of mm. tea when it's not being the the little bits of glue sticking animal parts together or making things go massive, huge. Mm. Uh, Phil, what do you think? Any positive applications for the tea virus? Maybe is there an alternative universe somewhere where it's, you know, the magical cure-all and everybody's happy? <laughs> I mean, it may be, although I tend to think that um, whoever in Umbrella is responsible, like their job is to come up with all these positive applications like curing cancer. The only person lower than them in the Umbrella food chain is the guy who's responsible for health and safety at the um, laboratories. Because obviously that's the guy who's managed to have every single laboratory has then had a spillage and then exploded. Um, which, how they never tanked on the stock market before the Raccoon City was nuked, I don't know. Um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there's definitely like stuff that you could potentially do there. But I think this feeds back into obviously the people who ended up becoming um, the top dogs, particularly um, Spencer. His name went out of my head for a second. Then um, focus more on the eugenics and this whole idea that being mm. superior to everyone else and wanting that to be reflected in reality and, and using the T virus and 
other means for for that sort of end and then um mm. obviously things like cure and cancer fall by the wayside if if your plan is basically omnicide <laughs> yeah fair point i suppose um and then just quickly before we so as I say, I want to circle back to progenitors because it is quite important in the grand scheme of things. Um, but as we sort of played through the games, get to about 2002, and we yeah, sort of alluded to there, sadly we didn't get the prequel about Bravo Team, but we did get a lot of information on the background of the C-Virus, on Marcus, um, and of course the introduction of the leeches in Resident Evil Zero. Uh, Phil, actually, when you kick this one off, what did you think about that sort of contribution to the lore that Resident Evil Zero... You know, because it is quite important now when we look back at the T-Virus. That's where we get quite a lot of information from. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll be honest, most of my knowledge of that, because I played Resident Evil Zero, but they've reached a point where I just wouldn't go back backtracking through half the level for um, <laughs> the hook shot anymore and I, I kind of stopped playing so okay. I never actually saw the end of it um, alright but yeah so most of most of that is kind of I've read about it since and around it but mm. um, it's it's definitely adds a lot more depth in terms of the characters in terms of obviously you know about like Wesker's role from in Umbrella and kind of fleshes out him as a character as well as William Birkin and everything that we learn about him that feeds into RE2. Um, I was always kind of unsure exactly how to take the leeches because th that's a terrifying prospect in and of itself, and particularly some of the enemies you're facing there, like the mm. leech men, like um, absolutely horrendous. I mean, we'll I know we'll come on to like um, best and worst POWs. Um, yeah, I, I've got opinions. On the leechman, but um, <laughs> there's there's obviously a huge amount of potential there in terms of something that can be sent out to kill and do damage. Um, although, again, like many other people, why the queen leech took the form it did, that uh, and s controlled its um, parts by singing opera, I, I <laughs> still can't get my head around. That's, that's a whole podcast right there, trying to figure that one out. See, I'm still going to go headcan-wise that Marcus, when he was making the leeches, was humming a tune or singing mm. to them in the tank. And then when they ate him, they their way of deifying their creator god is to sing his hymns. I know this is total <laughs> mad, mad headcanon this, but I think that's all it is. Like it's just speech. worshipping their lord, their lord that's and good. master, James Marcus. <laughs> that's, my, that's my canon now. Steve. Okay. Uh, James, how do you feel about the, the leech contribution to the story and what RE Zero did? And we're pre I'm going to be kind of negative here because, like, I, RE Zero, I love RE Zero. I love his characterization. It's got some great progressive themes in it uh, with some of the characters and stuff. But when it comes to the leeches being in the missing link for the D virus, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sold. Like, mm. no matter how free, like, they look really cool. They, they're like during that era, they're some of the coolest looking things. Um, but they could have like chosen any other br bug, like a cockroach, like something that is proven <laughs> to be indestructible. You know, like mm. leeches are just kind of mid. Like yeah. they're 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 There's not much you can do with a leech, right? Like... They're not threatening. Like I never felt threatened. I, I I don't know if this is it's just because like I didn't I wasn't around when it came out and like leeches were like a new thing mm. back then. Maybe that was like a new like thing, but. Like yeah, I was when I learned that they were the when they they were the key. I was like, really? Leeches? Yeah. Don't worry, James. I, I can tell you now. There are a lot of people when it came out felt the same way. That okay. Like, oh, we're reducing T viruses to leeches, and furthermore, in fact, of course, the outbreak from Resident Evil One was caused by a giant leech who thought she was a man, or if, you know, lots right. of leeches joined together. That sure, you know, it's. Bizarre. And, it's a bizarre contribution to the lore. And, and it's like, I think I think the other big thing about you know the the leeches is that they were just never brought up again. Like yeah, you know they. I mean, there's characters that had like kind of lamprey like uh, features to them, but leeches with how important they are to the backstory. And I know, yeah, sure, they got like blown up, you know, at the end. But the mm. thing is, like, that isn't Resident Evil, you know, because yeah. like zombies are surviving all the time tyrants are for some reason like being produced like like one oh mm. and from nowhere you know it, it, if you want to make them like a legitimate thing you need to keep them as a mainstay villain of some kind there is um, yeah 
I say there is a, a stalker enemy based around leeches in Outbreak File One in the hive, mm. but I think that's more of a they may have either used leeches in a medical aspect and it's all gone horribly awry. It's not like an engineered organism, or at least I don't believe it is. Yeah, it's not the same thing. No, certainly. it's it's, um, it's a different type of horrible T virus based leech. Mm. Yeah, like yeah. I I, I would have like it's cool that they've thought of it. You know, and they've kind of gone back on our roots as humans and gone like, well, we we still haven't technically figured out what our several missing links were between, you know, uh, Neanderthals right. and Homo sapiens, etc. Right. So they kind of looked at that as inspiration. Now they're like, OK, what can be, you know, let's bring some real world, which is what they do a lot. They bring real world mm -hmm. Like something we can connect our brains to and go, oh yeah, I know what a leech is. You know, I hate mm -hmm. it. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it it didn't really, it doesn't. After all these years, it still doesn't make sense because it just doesn't. It isn't a, a mainstay of the the franchise for something that is seemingly so important mm -hmm. to I, what came after it. Yeah, I agree. Um, because, I mean, leeches. I can see where they're coming from because you know we talked about. Earlier on, I was doing the law dump there about single cell organisms and stuff like single-minded organisms. And leeches have been around since, you know, hundreds of millions yeah, of true. years. So I do understand the logic, but unfortunately, I think it's a victim of circumstance. And I'm not complaining about, you know, Sirius taking a different route because Zero was kind of the last hurrah, maybe, yeah, with the exception of like Outbreak. Um, and we kind of departed from the T-virus from this point onwards. And again, logically speaking, it makes sense that we kind of splintered from the T-virus to all these kinds of different offshoots. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, dumping leeches in as the entry point right at the end of the T-virus sort of arc, if you like, just felt weird. And it, yeah, it still stands out as a bit of an I, odd thing for me. I just thought something else as well. I was like, does anyone here find leeches intimidating? <laughs> no, you can step on them. Right, right like... <laughs> I I have never found leeches intimidating, and I think that's mainly because... If they started singing at me, I might be changing my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think the, the other reason why I, I never found it is because I knew, like, I knew that, you know, leeches are used in medicine all the time, mm. like, as well. And I was just thinking, you know, that's that's where my brain goes. It goes, you know, leeches are not that bad. <laughs> See, although, kinda... although, I suppose in, like, the horror ropes like when leeches are used in medicine it's always in kind of those very backward True. ways and you know yeah, people who put, and... put, yeah put the leeches on mm. you and saw and then saw your arm off to cure a cough or whatever <laughs> type of thing <laughs> i guess what they yeah i would agree that's probably what they're getting at i mean that weird outdated science yeah marcus had the idea basically how do i get this t-virus to work and then he put a leech on himself and then magically wait no that doesn't make <laughs> um, I'm kind of like jump to its defense because I feel like in the whole pseudo pseudoscience madness nature of the series having a single cell analyd be part of its like first steps is moderately more interesting like I, I believe there are viruses that evolve over time that we can trace back to these kind of things from prehistoric mm. era so the, the pseudoscience meets regular science, science to a degree and the idea of having cannibalistic le leeches leading to cannibalistic monsters is okay, but there's a small part of me that's like, well, why can't we find like leeches in T-virus zombies? Why isn't something like growing to protrude out, jump out? Like, yeah. so I had a similar problem with Village and the Kadu. Like, I don't see these weird heart-shaped things, fetuses anywhere except like as iconography or in glass jars, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which is probably a little bit too much of Steve has played Dead Rising once or twice and the little grubs that come out of zombies in certain situations kind of <laughs> blend together. Um, mm. But overall, having a simple organism be part of the early like building blocks, if you like, I think is novel and mm. leads into a bit more science. I suppose leeching itself is crap, but uh, a what other thing can you have? Like worms, microbes, yeah. uh, you know, flotsam and jetsam in the sea. I, it, it's <laughs> I feel like it's it's a bit of a cop out, but the idea is novel. I, oh yeah, I'd agree with that. And actually, you just said building blocks. So that is going to nicely take us on to... Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the progenitor. We won't give it its own episode, so it makes sense to slide it in here. And again, you know, we just got to... Well, how about this lore dump in Resident Evil Zero? Of course, we got even more backstory by the time of Resident Evil 5 via this, you know, 
through the progenitor part of the T virus's lifespan. So I'm going to once again read from Resident Evil podcast some selections here before we talk about the progenitor. Um, a virus that had high capacity for environmental adaptation and every living thing served as a vector of infection. This improbable trait was only possible because progenitor itself represented itself as one of the building blocks of life, giving birth to the primitive form of RNA from a primordial soup of proteins. Thanks to progenitor, these proteins organized into a membrane then began self-reproduction. Complex life on Earth developed and thrived as a direct result of the progenitor virus. It was rediscovered by modern man on December 4th, 1966 in West Africa and was confirmed by scientists James Marcus and Edward Ashford of being capable of recombining a host's DNA. Direct infection would result in an uncontrollable mutation of the host's genetic co code, resulting in, a strain in strange protrusions and abnormal growth defects all over the body. This process was isolated as the DNA mutation attribute and was hailed as the ultimate characteristic of the progenitor virus. Over time, complex life forms lost the genetic adaptability to withstand its effects until eventually all those who exposed would suffer intense mutation or die outright. Uh, originally, it was used by the Endopia tribe thousands of years ago to seemingly determine kings or even gods, but again, by the time of its rediscovery, it carried a 100% mortality rate in humans. And obviously from here begins Marcus's experiments to kind of whittle that down, take a part of the progenitor and work on it to develop what we just talked about with the early days of the T-virus. Um, so sort of same sort of question with this one. And um, we don't need, need to go too long on the progenitor, but how do we, you know, think, what do we think about, you know, this inclusion of the law? Uh, we just talked about leeches being introduced, but now we're, we're going way back to like, well, flowers, in fact, the stairway to the sunflower is where progenitor is rediscovered. Um, during the game. Uh, Steve, how do you feel about the inclusion of Progenitor? I mean, I guess we knew about it beforehand, but we got a lot more from this point. Don't you mean the Primogenitor virus? <laughs> the Primogenitor, oh yeah. Uh, no, oh, I okay. like it a lot. I, I, I feel like this is a bit more appropriate for the series, mm. in my opinion. Like, before this, like... Before RE4, before RE5 gave us basically the, 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 the true deep lore on Progenitor, we had like, you know, the fungal spores of Las Plagas, and that felt way cooler than there's this dude with some leeches. So having ancient <laughs> earth stuff under, uncovered and having like, you know, the, the idea that the, uh, I'm not even going to attempt to mispronounce the, the name of the tribe, you know, having them basically go through nature, eating this thing to decide their rulership and then giving it like basically tyrants in the prehistoric age. On a better yeah, term, that kind yeah. of body shape. I can understand why that would make a sense as a, a building block, a true building block to the T virus, if you like, because it basically is doing what Marcus wants way back a million years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that is awesome. It, it's more compelling. And the fact that it's also incredibly awkward to handle, like you have to have the right conditions. And until like the 80s, they, they struggle to even get it out of that yeah. zone. It makes it more. I don't like using the word, but like an exotic, mysterious item. Mm. Uh, more so than, yeah, I'm going to play with some leeches and uh, look at this. <laughs> and this is coming from the person who just defended them, you know? Mm. Uh, and then it because, well, <clears throat> that now it's actually too dangerous. They have to basically water it down like uh, a gin and tonic, you know, make the T-virus a thing because mm. progenitor is just too dangerous. Uh, yeah, uh, basically being the granddaddy to it all, I think it's really neat. Yeah, I agree. This is cool because um, I really love the idea that this thing that the T-virus eventually spawned out from is so important that life on the planet doesn't exist without it. Suddenly a lot of things make sense. And yeah, of course, it's pseudoscience, as with a lot of Resident Evil is, but it fits into Resident Evil's world and it makes Resident Evil's world more unique by making it slightly different to ours, although not really because we do have proteins and stuff that are you know super important to the existence of life this is just kind of like this crazy one that now humans just can't deal with anymore in the slightest uh big time agree and also a little bit of a callback almost or a re maybe a a reuse of re4's original backstory mm. with the 
the giant, the Irish giant, that was its name, I think, in the RE4 beta. The progenitor was meant to be found in a long ancient human under Spencer's home. That was the original idea. And this is sort of a similar kind of thing in a way where it's, it's yeah, it's an ancient thing. So it was uh, like I, Batman with the bats in the cave, but instead it's a giant fossilized man <laughs> going, I want to make more of these. Oh, uh, yes, Spencer, fossil man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing. Phil, how did you feel about the uh, introduction of Progenitor and the, the story that we got from that point? I liked a lot of this because, I mean, one of the things that I liked about Resident Evil 5, I mean, um, particularly because I was always sort of annoyed by Resident Evil 4's kind of killing Umbrella off off screen and then just yeah. completely changing tack and it, it being all about... Um, something different essentially and although we got these tie backs to everything kind of on the side they, this in re5 really felt like they actually finally give us a proper end to umbrella by giving us the end to spencer and the end to wesker and, and that sort of thing and having at the same time we discover where it all began and the origin of it all kind of felt like it all fit together in one um package in that way and it added an extra sense of uh discovery about it like again mm. going back to that sense of you kind of unraveling the mystery is like even though we already know at this point everything that umbrella's done there's still more to unravel and the the, the law gets deeper with this kind of new discovery and, and everything in there and it also again from what we were discussing about the leeches it kind of obviously the leeches are supposed to be the, the link between the progenitor and the T, but it also still feels like this kind of makes more sense as an origin than the leeches in Zero because, mm. like, it, it it seems to flow more naturally without that sort of, you know, weird stinging entity and everything else that comes <laughs> with it from there. Mm. Um, mm. But, yeah, I, I really like that as far as, like, how it brought the law together and also how it gave us a beginning at what was effectively the end for the whole arc from Umbrella and the leaders of Umbrella point of view. Yeah, I I like to sing RE5's praises and the important stuff that it does for the overall lore of Resident Evil. And obviously some of that's on the surface with your flashback to Spencer and Wesker and your Chris and Wesker showdown. But obviously a lot of this isn't really necessarily in the game. It's in sort of side content and files that you might be reading in menus and stuff. But nevertheless, um, this is one of my favourite things about RE5 is what it did for the lore. James, how do you feel about, you know, learning about the origin of Progenitor and how it slots together with everything else? Okay, so anybody who knows me when it comes to, when it comes to, like building up a storyline like an overarching storyline i love ancient civilization tropes <laughs> like <laughs> anything like is ancient anything that is you know that it's far more complex than we can comprehend and has like you know has had to, so much time to evolve and like to the point that we can't fully keep up or fully understand it i love that stuff like I love connecting it to myth and legend, which is what they did in RE5 and other games. Like, they connected yeah. it to, like, like you know, I mentioned it earlier on, but gods among people. You know, they used to see uh, people who are immune. They used to be, like, basically demigods and people who were, like, who used to get the, the superhuman strength and speed used to be seen as gods themselves. Mm. You know, I think it's so cool. You know, because it's like, you know, it's 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 within that um, you know, it's within that plausible di like deniability kind of you know section where it's like, well, m okay, they might see them as kind of like how we see Jesus. Or a lot of people see Jesus Christ, right? Like it's like you know, well, we know they are a guy, maybe <laughs> at some point. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, really cool to think about, um, and I love, uh, yeah, I love that they, and it, it's it's also why. You know, I'm I'm so uh, I get so hyped about kind of new law drops like with that RE7 put down because it's further kind of cementing that you know the progenitor like has it has evolved into so many different things, you know, and done and mm. or, or it's been like messed with and 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 like kind of yeah just just experimented with and gone down like even by its own own admission. We don't know whether it's intelligent or not, and like mm. I don't want to know that information really. Um, mm. Yeah, you can easily kind of explain all the stuff that's happened away due to time or unknown factors, or 
yeah, it's a really great hook because it's like you can literally do anything with it. Mm. You see, um, there was a deleted love- scene in Resident Evil Zero where Marcus turns to Spencer and he goes, "We are made men by the flowers." <laughs> Fear the old flowers. Uh, no, play book one, everybody. You'll get that reference. I'm hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I, uh... da- and then David from the Alien Universe comes in. <laughs> you need law rooms, okay, guys. <laughs> I love, uh, I'm the same with you, I love sort of thinking about what we know about this sort of ancient version of tyrants and the civilization using progenitor and stuff. Something that we'll almost certainly never get a proper look at, but it's so interesting to think about that that happened in Resident Evil's past and history is kind of repeating itself in a weird way, except sort of a, not in a natural way, Uh, you know, back then they would have just ingested the flowers or whatever they were getting it from and hoped for the best. Now we've sort of, as humans, kind of made a perversion of that by turning it into the T-virus um, and spreading it throughout the world, it, which brings... Oh, sorry, go on. Sorry, yeah, I was going to finish by saying... This is a... I, James is running on, like, three hours sleep, right? So here we are. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> can't believe we're going to say this, right? I, I believe, you know, I'm a firm believer in science and, like, what we've discovered, but we've also discovered a lot of things recently that go beyond what our understanding of science is, and that's what science, you know, the future of our science is. It's discovering new things and debunking other things, right? And I just think it's kind of wild that dinosaurs lived for millions of years, right? Mm. And that they never, like, there was never an intelligent, really, dinosaur or something that kind of evolved above, like, right. beyond that point, and then a meteor came down and destroyed all of them i I believe all that you know i believe there were dinosaurs and stuff of course there were right but it's just like it's wild to me and i think that is something that re like with this could build like really interesting into their universe is that that you know they these flowers were back then and they there was an intelligent race right of people Right, that we're just yeah, eating no, these. The Mario Brothers movie here, James. <laughs> just, 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 no, 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 no. Like Disney will, Disney, Disney? Nintendo will come after us. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they'll buy them next year. Who knows? Right. <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> Are you pitching your own series on like the History Channel? One of those pseudoscience uh, ancient flower people. Phil, every every time I come on a law episode, I do this. <laughs> Someone take the the meme, the aliens guy, aliens the space on it, and put progenitor or something. It, it would be, it would like I, I wouldn't. It'd just be not, It'd be cool, like to have something like that. <laughs> like, like please make it alternate. It's not. It's like I don't want it to be right. our world, right? Just it's an alternate universe. You know, just be cool to have like an intelligence race of beings that were that far back, and then they all got wiped out, and then we discovered them again. You know, that's cool to me. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, bring it back to uh, the current day of the T-virus and talk a little bit about the strains over the years. Um, This was more just a question that I wanted to ask everyone because I was curious. Um, And it's not necessarily, and it might not be that big of a deal really, because if you're coming in at certain levels of interest with Resident Evil, you just go T-virus. Okay, cool, T-virus, that's it, move on. But there's actually, you know, like a dozen different strains of the T-virus before we even get to like crazy offshoots like Phobos and Abyss and stuff, the T virus itself went through Alpha, Beta, Delta, Epsilon, blah blah blah, blah all that stuff. Um, do we like that aspect to it? Again, it's I, I find I guess it's quite ignorable if you're not that interested in it. But are we are we into that as a realistic aspect or is it confusing? Phil, how do you feel about it? Um, I think it can, if you're not kind of if you're following it casually, it probably is really confusing because even. As someone who, who regularly reads deep into the lore, both in the games themselves and just kind of occasionally disappears down rabbit holes on <laughs> yeah. in wikis, it, like it's still there's still plenty that's confused about it. Um, but I mean, obviously, as we saw, kind of with even just the strains of like the COVID pandemic, like the different ones that came up, it, there's realism right. there. Yeah, um, yeah. But at the same time, they probably didn't even. It feels like they probably explaining more than they necessarily needed to because I, I imagine a lot of game fans like playing it would just be like oh this time there's a different you know instead of hunters we've got liquors it's like, oh cool we don't yeah. need to explain this strain or that strain it, it adds more for us you know law nerds but I think mm. they don't they don't necessarily need to do it it like they could get away <laughs> with just being like this is all the t-virus 
We're just throwing different bits at you in different games. Mm. It does make me wonder if if this matches up with the Japanese sort of translation for the game. Because, you know, the Japanese approach to video gaming in general, you know, they would see a, luck, a liquor and sort of be like, okay, it's just sometimes humans turn into liquors instead or something. You know, whereas we in the, in the West want to know why we have different BOWs and why this this time and not other times. So I do actually wonder if it matches up perfectly, but I don't actually know. But yeah, I guess it is just a case of it's there if you want it. Um, Steve, agree? I I generally love how it is more of a, if you're just a casual fan, the T-Virus does everything, but if you get into the weeds, you can learn all these cool little things about it and that there are realistically many different variant strains and it allows loopholes mm. for if they need a narrative excuse for oh we can't cure the t-virus do we know why and it's because it's this new ancient strain found in some umbrella lab in like you know canada or whatever you know it's it, <laughs> it, it allows a lot of accessibility and believability yeah. like you know because like we've already said covid does many different things cold and flu changes every year and, yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes sense on that regard i actually do dig it Mm-hmm. And also, as, as we talked about, Umbrella just continually trying to perfect this thing. So they would just keep tweaking away and, you know, coming up with new names for it every time. Like how every time you save a project in Premiere Pro and you add a new final to the end of the title, final version <laughs> two, final really this time, you know. Yeah. It's pretty much, it's pretty much for that. real this time, though. <laughs> yeah. uh, James, how do you feel about this sort of reiteration um, idea? Uh, it's confusing. It, it it confuses my head as I was looking down <laughs> them. Like I was, it, it yeah, it makes complete sense in the real world. And yeah, they're going for the realism. And that's fine. It's just like you're playing. It's a video game. Like <laughs> and it's you know, yeah. uh, it's like the only one I can really think about, and it's because it's the coolest for me. Is uh, is V Act for right, me for sure. Like yeah. the rest, I'm like. Beta, beta two, alpha, <laughs> epsilon, huh? Like yeah. I, it's you know, it's not very, it's not very accessible to mm. new and even <laughs> old, uh, like members to the to the community. It's it's pretty hard to read. The uh, worst part I is would... it's not even game dev iterative, is it? Because it's not like beta will then do what also what alpha can and epsilon can do what right. beta can. Right. Mm. Yeah, there's I was actually put in my notes that there's there's not really a pattern that's followed. And even yeah. if there is a pattern that's followed, it's then broken immediately. Um yeah, so yeah. it's 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 very hard to get my head around. That's fair. That's completely fair. This is why I asked, you know. Everyone's going to have different opinions on that depending on how they read these kind of things. Um so completely fair. You know, it depends if you feel like going oh it's the beta 2 strain of t-virus it makes you feel really cool or makes you just confused yeah. and feel like an idiot you know it's so <laughs> it's, yeah, it's different strokes and all april 22nd 1978 the leeches no longer exhibit individual behavior even when not feeding they move as a collective they consume everything I offer with remarkable efficiency. April 30th, 1978. An employee has stumbled onto my experiments. Can a human be a food source? How will the leeches respond? June 3rd, 1978. A day worthy of commemoration. Today, they begin to mimic me. Oh, surely they recognize their father. Wonderful children. No one will take you away. So let's get into probably the most exciting part. Um, I feel like we've gone a lot longer than I thought we were, so that's kind of cool. But we are going to talk about the BOWs, of course. And we are going to sort of go in strain order to build up a picture of the T-Virus as it was made. Um, so the Alpha strain um, was actually, I guess, the prototype T-Virus created by Marcus through the leech DNA, uh, infecting insects. Again, logically, to me, that makes sense. You've got ancient creatures with some, you know, mini beasts and bugs and arachnids and these kind of things. Um, but the Alpha strain was actually extracted from the web spinner BOW, one of the many spiders. So our starting point really 
um, is the many, many bugs, which, um, again, we're going back to Resident Evil Zero with this, prominently filled with insects, which to some degree makes sense because the alpha strain infects these ancient species and not a whole lot else. Um, James, how do you feel about the alpha strain and I guess not necessarily the strain itself, but bugs, <laughs> T-virus oh, bugs, love them or hate them? I, this is by far like the best B.O.W. series for me. Like, <laughs> I love these guys, like, because they're so varied. Like, you can tell with these, you know, I'll go into other stuff later on because I do have other favorites, but you can tell that the designers of these uh, BOWs had a great time, you know, and mm. the modelers and stuff, they had a great time designing these um, and just having fun with it. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's, and it's always interested me as a, as a, when I was a kid, I was a typical boy where I just used to, like, I would used to just to have like a handful of bugs and I used to like walk into the house and go, look, mom, I've got <laughs> bugs. And then she would scream, you know, and, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it's always fascinating. You know, insects are amazing as well in mm -hmm. terms of how, like their communities and stuff and how they, they do things. Um, yeah. So I love it. I think they are underutilized. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like, you know, I, I, I have I have an intolerance of spiders and bugs. Like now, I leave them alone. They leave me alone. Um, but yeah, they're underutilized. Like these guys were going to be used in warfare. Like yeah, <laughs> crazy, isn't it? Right, they're freaking terrifying. They're so scary. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you 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 throw like a grenade at them and they just shatter into pieces, <laughs> you know, or something. Which which yeah. kind of was really was really sucky because you like. I, I've always imagined a bug that's the size of us. You know, I think about. You know, what? this is going to be a really weird reference, but you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I was waiting for it. You know, I was waiting for it. <laughs> you know, the yeah, ants in that—they're terrifying, mm. right? They—they've because they're, they're they're you know they're relative to your size, right? And their carapace is so difficult, like to get through. Like, I was expecting when we had bugs to, for them to actually be, like, big. Tanky. And, yeah, and, like, really <laughs> tanky. Because they've got freaking carapaces. Like, they are mm. tanks, um, you know, in the, in the, in the, uh, at their relative size. And I was expecting them to be big tanky boys, but they were not. And they've kind of explained that away by the Alpha Strain not being, like, not doing as intended. Mm. It made them grow but it didn't give them strength um, and and speed. Like, mm -hmm. well, some of the bugs it did, but, you know, uh, the only thing that the, the spiders got was being able to climb well, which is great. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So I just... It, it, it seems really under, underutilized, and something... I'm going to say this every time a new game comes out, but we need bugs back. Like, especially spiders. <laughs> the problem a lot of people have it take issue with RE0 just being full of bugs and not a lot else, which I sort of can see that perspective absolutely, but like there needs to be a spread of them. We need to have them come back. They're really good as, you know, even just as secondary infectants and stuff like that, as we know. Um just add some cool variety. And bugs are a common fear. They're scary for a lot of people and anything that's bigger than it needs to be is scary to me. So like a giant spider sounds absolutely awful i'm yeah. i'm all about it um yeah you know considered a failure because i think other than just being kind of flimsy uh yes they got a little bit more poisonous in some cases and maybe could climb a little bit better or whatever i think they were just intellectually stunted and couldn't really be controlled yeah. um, which maybe again speaks to that the ancientness of these creatures and how they're kind of just like they're in their ways now as you said they've got their own communities they know what they want and they go by their own sort of beat of their own drum they just do what they do and it's insects isn't it that's just how they are so yeah not very good in that sense but in terms of a co the contribution to the bow list of resident evil i uh yeah I, great some great designs because yeah essentially you could just say they're just big versions of bugs but you can tell i agree the people designing them went cool i can take this identifiable scary shape and just make it cribbly yeah. <laughs> like the <laughs> are so gross oh, that's a whole yeah that's definitely like, a thing isn't it yeah I, I like just a quick quick mention of black tiger for a second i didn't realize that black tiger 
was apparently a stronger version, just for no reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just yeah, became like games. a stronger <laughs> version of every other spider. Why didn't they just? Here. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't they just take? Like, you know, samples of... But, well, they kept sending teams down there and Black Tiger keep eating them. But still, you know, you send teams <laughs> down there. Chris and Jill managed to do it. You know, um, yeah, although they basically, you know, you can knife it to death. It's fine. Like, just yep. bring it down there. Uh, yeah, that's very underutilized. I need more bugs. Uh, Steve, how do you feel? Do you need more bugs? I, yeah, I feel like it's... Uh... An untapped well with a lot of potential if they go the right route. Like, particularly the body horror route. I, I always liked the web spinner as a giant bug off spider, and the fact that they have a bit of pack mentality when they all hoard around Black mm. Widow, it has, they have their own alpha, they have their own, like, you know, tier of authority. Uh, but then you look at the likes of, like, is it Centurion, the giant millipede, and then the trained scorpion? Uh, yeah. they, you know, they're just great big bugs. I think the only other bug hierarchy we have is the uh, the bytes and megabytes and gigabytes, which are in like the mm. outbreak train tunnels. Uh, yeah. But they might be quote unquote mass produced strain T. But it, yeah, anyway, that bugs in general, like if they go more into body horror aspects, like I love the idea of man spider, this thing that literally latches oh. onto people and morphs into them. But if we have more moths, I will be angry. Like hashtag praise it. a moth all you like, but the moth in Co Veronica can do one. <laughs> uh, Uh-oh. You know, the Moth in RE2 is cool, afraid. but the Morning Code Veronica can go do one and burn it to death. Can, can you hear that, guys? You've, you, that's that's the internet angry. The, the, <laughs> split the church. I don't care. We'll have Catholicism <laughs> and the other one. Uh, <laughs> but generally speaking, bugs are cool. They are neat. Although I feel like we've leaned a little too hard, especially in the early days, of just make it huge. There needs to be a bit mm. more to them. Like the CV... Ironically, the CV spider, I think, is a lot more cool than just, here's a giant fairy bugger. Well, it is just a big spider, though. But yeah, I like but that it's green and purple and all... Yeah. Right, find an interesting species, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we literally have an example. Netflix Resident Evil. Yeah, yeah. yeah that would yeah, yeah. be mint. And it looks all twisted and malformed. Yeah, more of that, yeah. please. Yeah, great spider. Um, Phil, how do you feel about bugs in Resident Evil? And also, while we're there, you might as well move us on to the next bit as well, because as part of the Alpha Strain, we also got Neptune, and I can't be sure, but presumably Yawn here too, because again, sort of ancient species that are very well tapped into what they are biologically. Yeah, well, I mean, on the the bugs thing, I I'm not I was never like hugely grossed out by bugs or anything, although I don't want to keep them as pets at the same time. <laughs> um, but I think if I was, you know, someone I was buying BOWs off Umbrella because I wanted to use them in Warfare, then the certain ones I'd take happily, whether like your Plague Crawlers or your Chimeras um, or the Code Veronica Moth, I would just put that in every enemy hallway and they'd be done for. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, like a lot of the giant spiders, I'd, given how much I just pretty much run by them and don't even bother interacting with them in i think virtually every iteration that they're in in, in whatever game they're not really that much use in war or i can't imagine them being much use as weapons um yeah. they would have to have kind of something more about them where um the big is it a centipede or a millipede in re0 that, that grabs mm -hmm. rebecca and like runs around you could i suppose you could use that as like um like hostages or something to just go up and <laughs> grab a person and run like something about that although it was kind of surreal and slightly silly when the boss fight happened yeah if they did that right that that could be a, a terrifying kind of enemy that sort of thing that just like moves with that speed and grabs and takes your partner away and and could do all this sort of stuff um so there's a lot of potential there but i feel like the bugs have either been um I'm, I'm, again i'm mostly thinking gameplay rather than law i suppose but they, mm. they've they've either veered between largely useless or absurdly annoying <laughs> that's fair um completely fair but yeah i uh, i mean on the neptune and yawn i like i mean uh, the the sharks thing in resident evil was always like the i think the first time i played that because it was ages after i played rv2 when i finally played re1 for the first time and just like running around just the, with the water, <laughs> like this shallow water, and the sharks come after you was always a surreal experience as well. 
Um, but yeah, I think again, I mean, they've got their uses, but I think Yawn's probably the one that gives more sort of chills in terms of yeah. as a creature, because obviously there are limitations for the shark in terms of it being tied to water and so on. Although, I suppose there's ways to, to kind of integrate that if you wanted to, but having the snake being able to like break through things, but also slither around in the way it does it, in Yawn's form, like I think that was always absolutely fantastic as an enemy. Yeah, as a person who doesn't love snakes, I have to say, I'm not a big fan of Yawn. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, yeah, I mean, when we talk about this, and obviously this is where we can definitely come in from a gameplay perspective, yeah, Yawn, you know, is really cool and kind of makes some sense. And yeah, it's interesting. Neptune, again, I can sort of see why they did it in a sense of, well, let's just put it in anything and see what happened. And it was early days. But yeah, from a gameplay point of view, massively underwhelming, unfortunately. Um, that being said, excited to see where this goes with Death Island since we're apparently getting uh, aquatic BOWs again by the look of it. Steve, how do you feel about Neptune and Yawn? Uh, Johnny, I feel like they're more... They're more effective than their predecessors, the insects, because they have more of a hunting instinct, you know, obviously the shark and yeah. the snake respectively, but they don't, they fit more of a scientific, can we do that, rather than a B.O.W. we can sell kind of logic to me. They, they, mm. You know, I, I wouldn't, I am an evil umbrella person trying to make a profit. You know, there's a, there is a limited market for fish weapons, I feel like, <laughs> you know, may, maybe a few pirates on the high seas could have a few chain Neptunes they could unleash and go, <laughs> go Jaws them. Uh, you know, <laughs> God knows how you'd contain a snake and utilize it in any capacity where it doesn't eat your own troops. <laughs> but as a <laughs> as an actual intimidating figure in like a, a place of chaos, like the Spencer Mansion, they're cool, they're neat. Um, Yawn more so because it's just generally that much more of a viable threat. And obviously, aesthetically, they both look almost identical to their usual selves, but they are now massive and have like uh, tumorous blotches on them. So mm. that they have that uh, that early T virus, a bit ill aesthetic, which is neat, which is pretty <laughs> neat. But yeah, as actual weapon BOWs, they're a bit, uh, yeah, they're not going to get much yeah. money on the market there, Chief. I, I, feel. I don't think so. Yeah, uh, James, any thoughts on big old shark and big old snake? The most intimidating thing about Neptune is the cutscene and the 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 bit prior to it actually appearing. Mm. Like that is the most terrifying thing because when it actually, when the Neptunes pop up, they're kind of, yeah, they're not really that intimidating. No. Um, yeah, it's not really interesting. Yawn, however, many segments on yawn. <laughs> um, there are many segments. That's correct. Which uh, means that yawn is easily taken down by a well-positioned shotgun blast. Mm. Um, but yeah, yawn. Yawn is a like. Yawn is an icon in terms of um, like Resident Evil. You yeah. think of, like you think of Resident Evil One. You think like the top monsters from that, other than zombies. I think Yawn would probably be in the top three. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's yeah, it's it's not really much more to say because I think I've said so much like when it comes to the Alpha Strain. But yeah, mm, I, I think like I spiders are still my favorite, but Yawn is a close second for me. Yeah, put also, yawn in a movie, you cowards. <laughs> yeah, right. I, Neptune is scary under certainly uh, specific conditions, and those conditions are called remake run with a randomizer. <laughs> Where they just spawn yeah. in any random room that you walk in, and then they're terrifying again when you're in a s tiny hallway. Uh, but yeah, other than that, largely agree. Um, okay, so let's move on to the beta strain, quite an important, important strain. This um, was the combination between... Uh, presumably the alpha strain and the Ebola virus. Um, this is really where the zombie comes into play. Um, it was also used to create the Cerberus. So I guess in general, uh, this is where infecting mammals successfully really started to begin, rather than people just dying outright and that being it. Um, yeah, we got zombies. Again, not a particularly useful BOW in the sense of control, but in terms of spreading a virus and causing chaos... Um, I can certainly see the appeal of where it's coming from. Steve, how do you feel about... Well, how do you feel about zombies and Cerberus? <laughs> Two perhaps most classic BOWs of Resident Evil. 
Can't get enough of them. Although, obviously, future viruses like the C virus react a lot more quickly. Uh, the the idea mm. behind them and the fact that it's the, it's the haunting visage of your loved ones coming to eat you that gets at me for this one. Because I can see that's how this thing spreads. You infect one person, a family member goes, oh, no, Cliff's all right, honest. And then he bites them and then they bite someone else. Classic. You know, it, it, Full evil societal subversion, assuming people are stupid and don't know what a zombie is, which unfortunately in the Resident Evil universe tends to happen. Um, <laughs> Cerberus, I feel like I don't know how they would control them, uh, but as an idea, they are terrifying as a general presence. I mean, the, the the iconic jump scare, jumping through the window and ruining my brother's wallpaper. You know, it's <laughs> they are the first horror monster you see in the Resident Evil universe as well. So yeah, uh, I'm going to cut yeah. them a little slack. But they are just dogs that go yip. Uh, they, they, are, they are angry do- Dobermans that uh, are zombie-like and cross, you know, you know, get lost in the fandom, whether it's a Cerberus or a zombie dog, in that one is intentionally created and one is a secondary effect. And, but for gameplay terms, they look exactly the same and do the exact same noises and do the exact same attacks. So I don't get why people yeah. get so bent out of shape over it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. They are exactly the same. Not to mention that... 90% of the dogs in the Resident Evil universe apparently are Dobermans. Yeah. Because uh, we very rarely see any other. Not always. There is occasionally the odd other dog species that gets infected, but pretty much just, yeah. It's, it's a popular breed. Apparently, <laughs> apparently so, yeah. A popular, virally, very uh, susceptible breed. Yes, uh, but that's no, definitely it. As the groundwork you, you, for it. Sorry, James, you, you go on. You, you either get wolves or you get Dobermans. There's nothing in between. Yeah. <laughs> As the general groundwork, I think zombies in themselves, if they are just generic and faceless, they will be rubbish. Like, you know, Castlevania style. They just wear purple robes all the time. But in, yeah. in Resident Evil's case, they are implied to have been people. They normally have backstories. They normally have lore. And I feel like it gives mm-hmm. them a lot more weight. Like, yeah, RE1, you've got a lot of people who seem to think green blazes are fashionable. But other than that... You, you learn that they are basically security staff or scientists, and it gives it a lot more, I feel. Yeah. like Because that adds to the whole chemical spill aspect, and yeah, I, I think zombies are neat, everybody. To not yeah, you've, you've hit a nail on the head for me there when I think about the classic Resident Evil, at least the PlayStation trilogy, you get um, several characters that come, and you see them come back as zombies, obviously Marvin and RE2, it's possible to see Murphy as a zombie in RE3. Although you don't meet him as a human, you get Carlos's reaction to someone that he once knew being a zombie. And in RE1, we don't get any known or named characters specifically. Um, but we do read diaries and then are immediately accosted by people like the Keeper out of his own cupboard or whatever um, that add to that humanity aspect. So, yeah, definitely agree with that. James, how do you feel about zombies and zombie dogs? Uh, and and uh, baboons and monkeys, right? Yeah, I guess so, yeah, just the general yeah. mammalians. Like, one, like, before I go into I do have some negatives, but I think, like, they're just general, right? But, like, I do think, like, this is, in terms of the mental strain it would have on a, like, a population, this one mm. is the worst. Mm. Like, because it's, your dogs are not safe, your pet monkeys aren't safe, you know, if you've got a pet monkey, you know, um, your cats aren't safe, because I imagine cats would be the same thing. Um, though actually, you know, we all know cats are very extraordinarily smart, and they would probably just run away before this even all happened, actually. Um, but, yeah, like, it that's that's got to that's gotta take a toll on a, on a civilization, on a population, is seeing like your family and your friends turn not knowing like and it's something that resident evil touches on quite a bit uh well actually i say quite a bit it touches on a bit um i feel like it could be touched on a bit more is the is this is the the impact it has on on just people human beings Mm. and and things they love um now I'll go into kind of it's it's the most deadly of like all of these strains I think like it's killed the most people or it's turned yeah. the most people yeah. and I think you mentioned earlier it's got that ninety percent infection rate. Mm-hmm. Um, now in my notes uh, that was seen as not good enough. <laughs> yep. Um, the umbrella wants it a hundred percent uh win rate i was gonna say a uh, success rate um which gives us a great insight into how umbrella operates yeah spencer um, was a weird guy 
Yeah, they really, really wanted to, like, yeah, wow. Because, like, so I wanted that 10%. You know, you didn't. You you know, you'll kill 9% of the population. Like, you, you're good, man. <laughs> like, you don't need to go any further. But other than that, I think, like, this, I think it's been, you know, I've had decades of watching zombie stuff now. It's just it's so oversaturated with this kind of stuff. Um, I was when when we played Dark Side Chronicles and Umbrella Chronicles recently. I, it was nice to see bats and and baboons and monkeys again, like um, because mm. you don't see them very often, which was nice. But man, I'm so fed up of seeing Cerberus and zombies and um, you know even when I played remake uh, in the in the in the the server, it was like oh Crimson Head, that's a new thing. You know, it was nice. Um, but other than that, I, I respect that this is this is the main state. This is why everybody plays, that will start to play Resident Evil in the first place. Because uh, the story, and we've, we've spoken about it previously in this podcast, but the story behind these these zombies and how they came to came to be, and that's terrifying. And, like, thinking of it as a, as a human story um, is the thing that I am more interested in than the zombies themselves, like, mm. and how they act. Um, and how they go around because it's yeah is it, I've, I've seen too many zombies fair that's fair enough i can see where you're coming from um phil how do you feel about the beta 2 strain the mammalian strain yeah i mean zombies i think there's probably not too much more original i can say there that they, they are mm. oversaturated at this point but they're also classic iconic um and give that human connection and like we were saying earlier that whole idea of the virus kind of going beyond the eugenics and BOW designs of Umbrella and wanting to spread in a more chaotic and free way. Yeah. Um, and I think the the kind of I mean this with the Cerberus, they also again an iconic original enemy. Um, although I do think if if we see more of this kind of the virus stuff in the future, I would like to see like a zombie. Um, Yorkie or a zombie bulldog or something thrown in there just for <laughs> yeah. good yes. measure. Um, but I think, I mean, it, again, just kind of if I was the guy who was like taking all this stuff and using it in war, obviously zombies, that sort of infection spreads chaos and confusion around as people start to turn and all the usual human stuff. But I would just take a big cage full of eliminators and just drop them in the middle of a city and <laughs> that sort of chaos because. Those things are hell. Like they. Yes. Um, I'm glad we never saw any more of them. Yeah, from RE Zero. I'm glad we never saw any more of them in the future. But I'm also kind of surprised, given their effectiveness as a stun locking killing machine. <laughs> yes, for sure. Speaking of stun locking killing machines, that brings us nicely onto the Beta <laughs> Two strain. Um, this is. I think, Steve, you said the glue, T-virus representing glue. Uh, this is really that strain, uh, a more refined beta strain to create co more combat-focused BOWs. Specifically, of course, we're talking about the Hunter. And again, I don't know this for a certain, but it's you know easy to assume that we're also going to get the Chimera in this era as well, because this is where we start sticking DNA strands together uh, really playing God, things that were not meant to be. Um, Phil, how do you feel about hunters? Hunters, I think, are probably one of my favourite enemies in in the whole series in terms of mm. like just their kind of presence that they have and like the fear they inspire in you. Particularly, kind of if you if you face them and you're underprepared or you're trying to do a knife only run or something like that. Um, but the They've got this. I mean, they've got the iconic entrance into the series as well, where you see it from their point of view, and they like come through, and you, you, they're the first ones that you see open a door, and they've got that intelligence to them. Like mm. they're a lot more targeted. They're actually a weapon rather than some sort of chaotic offspring of a virus. That this is something yeah. that's been designed to kill. Um, and the, uh, there's a lot to like about like how that's done. And then I think the Chimera have got some of that to a degree, particularly when, because um, when you face them in in 
Ari, you've got that whole situation where you've got to walk really slowly without getting hit and without blowing yourself up and then they're there mm-hmm. as this threat. And again, it's something which has a presence to it and feels not just like, you know, something generic that populates the environment. It feels like, you know, they, they use sparingly and they're a genuine threat. And you definitely wouldn't want to come across one in a dark alley. <laughs> I wouldn't want to come across one in a light alley. Um, well, that too. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're horrible, awful, ugly, disgusting things. And they're one of my favorite BOWs, actually, the Chimeras, because of that. They are just hideous in concept, let alone design. Um, I really wish we would have seen a little bit more from them across the series because, yeah, like that, it, that's a psychological warfare element right there. Plus, they've got the ability to sort of mobilize and you know they work together and that sort of thing is terrifying and again same thing with hunters of course you're bang on by saying you know that's the moment in resident evil where you go no this one this is a weapon uh so yeah shout out to the beta 2 strain for that because i like that where this is the evolution of right now we're getting somewhere and actually creating specifically designed monsters that can somewhat do our bidding or at the very least can mobilize james how do you feel about the b2 strain the hunters the chimera oh man when watching steve play re1 because i won't play that game uh, <laughs> i understood the absolute terrors like these guys were the hunters they, they are i'll talk about chimeras in a second like i i actually i'll talk about them right now because the the hunters and the chimeras are very similar in their creation like and I love like the body horror aspect of how these things were created. Yeah. Like these things, like it isn't touched on much in the games other than notes. And I think that is I know it would be uncomfortable to have it in a game, like to have it front and center in an animation, right? But I think it should be, because it mm. would make people uncomfortable. Mm. Right? Like hunters are actually the lesser of chimeras like but they're still terrifying they're like you know they're they're um reptilian dna mixed with a human embryo that's Mm. injected into a human embryo right and then that's cultured chimeras (laughs) trigger warning pregnancy etc i think it's both james you know i think that is it i think yeah Uh, i think in in i I thought hunters hunters were more afterwards like they made okay. it, someone deliver it first, and then they. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the case. I'm going to double check that, but yes, the first, at least the first Chimera, and possibly the first Hunter as well, were birthed and then cloned. But yeah, basically, yeah, they like they find homeless women, but um, Umbrella found homeless women, brought them in, promised them things, like impregnated them with these embryos, and then they birthed them, like, and it was ah, oh, was gross, like, and that's that's like. Oh, that's, I mean, just the, if you had that as a scene, not the actual, you know, the deed, but have that as something, this is a threat here, like on screen is bloody awful. And just reading it in a note is awful. I feel like um, the closest we've ever seen to it in fiction since is like Alien Covenant, and that's only implied, you know, with uh, it's actually, spoilers, it's Elizabeth Shaw and David. It's actually, I can go even further than that. It's a bad movie. But Aliens vs Predator Requiem, oh, because the predator, the predator alien in that, like literally impregnates women by latching it itself onto them and then like putting the eggs down its throat, their throat, like that's kind of what I imagine, and it's so gross and disgusting, like that it made me squirm, you know, and it's like I, that is the only kind of scary bit and make about that movie because it was the only bit I could really see everything else is really dark about that listeners, but listeners yeah. I know James has recommended but winners winners don't watch that movie yeah don't <laughs> don't you, well you won't see it anyway guys it's literally like they put the bloody darkness all the way down to 10 it's awful um, but yeah it, the, these two these two like creatures the Chimera and the various hunters like are uh, an example of the absolute lengths that Umbrella would go to to make the very best BOWs they can without thinking of any consequences. Like they they just that you could just with these creations, you can tell that they just didn't care. Mm. Right? They just wanted to create something so chaotic, 
right? Yeah. Like that they just they were like, we can do it and we will do it, and here it is. You know, yeah. we don't care who we've hurt. Like, and that ah, oh, I I love to see that in a future game at some point. But I feel like we've kind of stopped uh, mm. that side of things. Maybe we'll revisit it far in the future. Um, but yeah, that's that's my opinion on on B two. It's it's my favorite, my yeah. favorite of the of the strains. We did have something in in terms of obviously not in the exact same way, but in terms of that kind of body horror impregnation stuff with um, RE three remake and and the uh, oh, yeah. the, the drain demos and, and like sort of latching down your throat, which was just like a really uncomfortable and horrible scene anyway. But um, so we we've got something of that, but. Like, I, I doubt they'd ever go further to show um, it yeah, being deliberately sure. used to create a BOW. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, that seems iconic because of how disgusting it is. And yeah, the implication there is bad enough for me. But yeah, it's the, um, the Drain Demons are kind of like a secondary offshoot from the Chimera being a secondary infectant. Gameplay-wise, they're kind of functionally, at least in the original RE3, functionally very similar. Um, so it was kind of nice to have that come back around in a way nice and also horrible um steve noted hunter fan <laughs> really? how do you feel about the beta 2 strain <laughs> uh, i feel like we, we talked about earlier about the potential positive applications or theoretical positive applications of the tyrant virus in any way shape or form and this basically is uh, the point where you could hand wave away in some version of resident evil where it's an altruistic virus that's just been let loose and gone wrong all the other all the other BOWs we've talked about, this is where that line crosses, and this has to be malicious intent, pure yes. evil to make these things, to make these weapons of war. And I love them. Generally, in most games they appear, they are the you know the the elite tier enemy before the bosses. And in mm. Hunter's case, they are easily the deadliest thing you're going to find in the mansion, followed maybe by Yawn, and then uh, generously the Tyrant. You know, they are terrifying. Generally speaking, I still occasionally get nightmares about hunters. Chimeras less so. I find them disgusting and great as a tribute to the Fly remake with Jeff Goldblum. You know, Brundle Fly. They look like that to me. I just see that. Mm. Uh, but hunters, they, I mean, there's a reason they've stuck around and they've had like four million different variant spin offs and versions, almost as many viruses. Uh, it's because they're yeah. amazing. They're like toad yeah. borgs from Bucky O'Hare, only they want to kill you and don't have mechanical parts yet <laughs> but they also have their like uh, they have at least in cv they have their own little spy camera and like you know it can be command and controlled and they're used to subjugate an entire city in terra Grigia. at least i assume there was all the bow's there but all we ever see is bloody tight you know enough to ruin the reputation we've seen nothing but hunters mm. um uh, as the step between evil mad science and making a super powerful monster man in the tyrant these are great like you know uh, dare I say they are my favourite monster of the entire pantheon I would love to see what the mould version of a hunter would do <laughs> oh god yeah I yeah certainly they're right up there I think in general and I think a lot of people weighed the flag as well because they're despite the fact that they've appeared through so many games in different forms they still feel a little bit underrepresented in terms of the marketing and in terms of adaptation we still haven't seen one in a film or a TV show so which is odd because they are kind of in their own way their own sort of poster child of Resident Evil especially the first game um, so yeah big fan because of just how awful Beta 2 is as you guys have said you know malicious intent um could you can we move on oh sorry yeah just quickly could you imagine i love that scene in netflix resident evil in the in the tunnel literally called tunnel i think or the channel with the liquors but could you yeah. imagine that tunnel full of hunters yeah Perfection. that would be so cool hunter they're out there for a reason <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so speaking of creating the weapons then, that takes us to the Epsilon virus, which is kind of the big one. Um, this is the one that, I mean, we don't, if we get into tyrant creation law, that's like a whole other podcast really, but uh, suffice to say, this is the tyrant strain. This is the one that is responsible for the T101 and the T102 um, that you fight in Zero, RE1 and Remake. Um, and then from here, of course, that data kind of, informs further reiterations of the tyrants but the epsilon strain really is where it all began uh steve how do you feel about tyrants <laughs> can we drop the sergey vladimir law and just keep all the other cool stuff please like that that, that, that 
Yeah, exactly. Like we were talking about uh, Spencer finding a progenitor human earlier. I would love my head cannon now would be if Spencer saw that and the tyrants were his interpretation of it. Like you have mm. the, you have the perfected version and then his knockoff brand, but the knockoff brand is these cool sleek terminators with giant claws. Um, I, I love them normally in their aesthetics design and purpose, but their gameplay is always a bit lacking. With the exclusion of like when he's off his chain, remake three Nemesis and remake two Tyrant, I feel like they're the only times they've really been intimidating gameplay presences as opposed to just looking awesome. Like they yeah. they always basically appear as the the scary big threat, or with the exception maybe of CV, where it's meant to be a training dummy. Um, yeah. They are neat. They still cut a cool silhouette. I'm glad they finally broke into the movies, even if they are like not the best in the live action film, and yeah. they are only just like giant murder muscle men, Frankenstein's in Damnation. Um, mm. As the end goal, though, I wish they had a bit more. I don't know. I, I, there's one particular tyrant in Outbreak File Two, which breaks its own programming and kills people and basically does its own thing and every other one has been basically a murderous automaton hmm. I kind of like him when they're not uh, hmm. Nemesis I suppose gets a bit of a bit of personality but other than that he's the only one yeah I think that's fair it would be really interesting to see a story where a tyrant kind of goes off its leash again um, and everything falls apart and you kind of almost have to team up with people on the umbrella side or something that would be cool because you're right it does kind of become a samey thing over time but of course they are iconic in their own right for certain um phil how do you feel about tyrants they i am um, i mean there's there's a lot to like about them and in, in a couple of particular ones which i'll come into but i think this will probably be a quite controversial point but in terms of like a, across a lot of the games they're just kind of they're very grey in the fact that, like, you know, the, from the RE1 tyrant versus the tyrant that appears in Code Veronica in the plane, and there's, there's a lot of sameness about them, which mm. I suppose is kind of the intent that coming off an assembly line effectively to make, you know, this this ultimate bioweapon, whereas I find it a lot more interesting when you've got, um, I mean, obviously Mr. X and RE2, and particularly the remake version, has got his own personality because of just how intimidating the presence he is. But mm. then I think the ones both nemesis for just how much of a force of nature he is and particularly in the original because mm-hmm. although it was scripted um and there were certain conditions that be met where when he'd appear it um that still absolutely like scared the crap out of me as as much as um mr x did like e- even playing it a lot older than when i very first played it like yeah. when you when you start to hear him saying stars off in the background, or then he just appear out of nowhere, like legging it down the, this really narrow lane that you can't escape from. There was <laughs> there was a presence and a power to him and, and that sort of thing, which I think made him a lot more compelling than the other kind of assembly line grey monsters. And then, mm. but the um, the other one was always a William Burke and Tyrant because of that fact that he's not something that's been made to follow orders and go off and kill a select target he's done that himself to kind of rebel against umbrella he like inject mm. himself and he's kind of going off on his own mission and there's more chaos there and both in terms of his path of destruction and in terms of the way he mutates and the way his form take evolves over the, the time of the gameplay and i think that's what makes them more interesting than the others to me yeah although of course the caveat there is that Birkin isn't T virus, he's G virus. So I mean well, that's yeah. what makes him more interesting. Like so in that sense, yeah. T virus, unfortunately, tyrant wise, because of the law implications, they do get a little bit samey, little as you said, production line. So um, can I ask yeah. a question for you? Like in, in this regard, like and imagine if you're coming from the same camp as me and Phil, would it be more the 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 way they are made, the way the sausage is made, if you will, like you know, the non- hetero beta serotonin and all that evil twisted science behind their manufacturing is sometimes more compelling than the actual final result yes actually i really like the lore of the tyrants with a few exceptions like you you know you mentioned the stuff there from survivor and the plant where they start pumping them out once they have figured out you know they've got that combat data from mari one like 
f- for Survivor, actually, on that note, is a perfect example because fighting the Mr. X is in, Ty- in Survivor is boring as any. I mean, that game's gameplay is not amazing, is it? But it's pretty boring. The most iconic moment is going to the room where there's loads of them and they've been mass producing them, and that's scary. The more I, the idea than the actual face off, certainly. I'm totally in that camp, and Steve, I'm completely with you. There are parts of the law that I really love, like them, you know, picking up death row inmates to turn into the tyrants. Um, but, and the fact that, you know, it only works for however many, one in however many people is quite interesting and exciting. But yes, then you get Sergei Vladimir. I don't like the cloning aspect, and I don't really like that he's, I wouldn't even say a Bond villain, you know, he's way worse than that. It's just a caricature stereotype, boring. I am the you know, Russian Soviet man Russian from yeah. the Soviet Union. Here are my batch of clones. Have them, Umbrella. <laughs> what a yeah, great novel that, prospect I am to the law. Yeah, it's, it's stretched it far too thin to me. Uh, the rest of it's really great. It's just let down by that sort of bit in the middle, unfortunately, but... There you go. Survivor is um, a good example, actually, of kind of the um, the lore and the backstory being a lot more interesting, as you say, than the end result. Because obviously, we had that quite dark story with the prison and, and like what they were doing with the, the youths and like using their parts and like why they mm. tried to stage the escape, which is an extremely dark story that we never really yes. got to see, and we instead got to kind of like mow down like three hundred Mister X's in a row or whatever. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, James, how do you feel about the tyrants? They're boring. <laughs> like, I, in terms of their creation, like, Umbrella are the Frankenstein and the tyrant is the monster when it comes yeah. to testing these guys. Like, they would die off or they would just cease to work. Occasionally one would work and we'd get what we have at the games. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the main thing that kind of like I, I I respect them as a you know they they are a poster child they're iconic in the series, um, I think they are creatures that should be higher than tyrants in that respect because mm. every time I look at a tyrant I don't see super soldier, and that's what they're supposed to be. <laughs> okay, right. You know, um, I see I see hunters as super soldiers more than I see tyrants. Yeah. You know, you could you can run away from a tyrant. Like, you know, like you could literally like, but Hunter, Hunter's, I mean, it's literally the name, you know? Um, yeah, but yeah, I can't, but however, I can't help but think how much more deadly the tyrants would be if Umbrella actually worked on them better by splicing. It does seem like they kind of, they got a little bit of combat data and they went, right, that's it, off you go, mass production time. It feels like there was yeah. a lot more research and development they could have done. <laughs> like, they, could, like data, imagine... they lost to a rocket launcher. <laughs> like, I- imagine how deadly a tyrant would be if they splice hunter DNA with it, right? Like, and like, an what they would have. I want to see, <laughs> <laughs> and what they would have created, or maybe. I mean, this is going into what my crimson head note is, notes is, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put it here instead. Like a hunter v acted tyrant, yeah, a crimson tyrant, yeah. if you will. Like you know they're. <laughs> they they have a I mean that would be dope but we're never gonna get that right they're slow they have a very clear weak spot I don't know what the <laughs> heck Umbrella were thinking when they made this guy like and well these seven that bit guys. always gets me because <laughs> it looks like, cool said mm. Albert to the rest of the people in the art they <laughs> love. <laughs> It's it's great for gameplay. It's great for us. Like we can clearly see what the weak point is. It was very in back then. Yeah. You know, to have a weak point, it was great. Mm. It's just like you have all these other characters, all these other BMWs, which are clearly more superior. You know, um, and cheaper to make. Do like, we, <laughs> do we know how in, how intelligent, generally speaking, a tyrant would be without its programming chip or whatever? Gone in- Got an intelligence of three, Steve. Oh, no, it's because I, I, I talked to you earlier about, about one going off the rails, and now for some reason, I don't know why, all right, the, the, the plot point of Tekken 2, right, one of the characters, Jack, a robot, <laughs> this. a robot goes haywire, and it goes from trying to kill everybody to saving a little girl. And I kind of would like the idea of a tyrant going off the rails in the oh, positive yeah. aspect, and it's decided I'm going to protect this small child. We've oh, come yeah, up give, with a lot of great Resident Evil Water <laughs> stories tonight, haven't we? Yeah, yeah give, give, me a, give me a give me a give me a tyrant redemption arc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a tyrant that can't necessarily speak, can't really emote, but wants to protect this small puppy. 
<laughs> so t- Terminator Two with the tyrants. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Don't sue my camera on all that. Yeah. Don't, don't sue me, James Cameron. We've already took the mic out of Scott, though, so y- you're welcome. <laughs> all right, I'm going to group the last two together um, because they are very related. Um, which, of course, we're talking about the V-Act strain, as James alluded to, um, this extra mutation in, uh, added in from Remake, or specifically just in Remake, really. Um, although, no, actually, that's not fair. It does come back around in RE6 subtly. Um, but, yeah, the act of a monster going down and then coming back again, um, we also got this as explanation, retrospectively, for the liquor which is actually part of the mass-produced strain. This is the strain that kind of winds up on the black market, I believe. Um, But yes, this so the liquor's similar thing. They kind of are creatures that have died of hunger and then come back again. So, you know, they do fall under the same umbrella of BOWs that have the V-Act, and that obviously makes them very different, kind of that information shoveled in sort of separately from the fact. Um, Steve, how do you feel about the V-Act monster? The monsters and the strain in general, I guess. I still wish it was more cohesive. Like in my in my head, it always made sense that you should have zombie, then crimson head, then a liquor. The fact that it's basically yeah, it's a, a popular thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I know they're not. Like you know, one one version is the V Act, and then the later strain is obviously the liquor. Uh, you know, it, it boggles my mind that the, the movies are turned to make it so liquors are intentional creations. And obviously, I think they yeah. they sort of are by the time of RE five. Like that's more of probably umbrella yes, those found are. people, infected mm. people, killed people, let them come back as liquors and so on. Um, mm. But initially, as a, a secondary mutation, the idea of something coming back and it's developed a new kind of intelligence and is now infinitely more dangerous than it was before. It, it's it's a weird one. It's like it's taken uh, one step back in that it's died, but it's it's taken three leaps forward and it's now way more agile, way more intelligent, way more dangerous. Mm. In that regard, I think it's neat. Like we will talk about the Crimson Tyrant earlier. That's an aw- another awesome thing. Imagine a Resi game where you kill a tyrant early, early on, and then late stage, like, oh no, he's back. And this time mm. he's angrier with even more claws. Like that, that, <laughs> that is basically what Crimson Head is. And the fact that in, in RE1 remake specifically, it's a uh, mechanical choice, and you have to really plan your route around whether you're going to clear all these zombies out, try and not kill them, so you don't make more of these things. Uh, yeah. You know, they are only basically angry zombies with claws. Uh, they're probably like below hunters in terms of deadliness, but they behave very similarly. Yeah. Uh, Lickers also fill that same niche, and they have a great buggering tongue and a, a distinct silhouette that just carries over. It looks awesome. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, it's interesting to think about the fact that a creature dies and then comes back. Um, Phil, you mentioned fairly early on, you know, sort of like the wants of the virus and to sort of carry on going. Do you think that that kind of is a feature here? I, I think it definitely seems to be that sort of kind of like, no matter what, the they need to keep keep spreading. Um, mm. I mean, it's also just an absolutely fantastic gameplay mechanic as well because it, it doubles that whole thing of like, you're already kind of, what ones do I kill? What ones do I leave and run past? And then you've got the extra thing of it's not just about conserving ammo now, it's if I kill it, it'll come back as this thing, which is just absolutely terrifying as it like kind of levitates off the ground into a standard position in this kind of stiff way and then just starts chasing after you and screaming and just I am um, I I'm still kind of baffled that they never thought to bring that back in any of the uh remakes. I mean we got the kind of pale heads which were creepy in their own right. way, but they're not related that that I'm aware of. They're just No, I don't think so. Um kind of a stronger, whiter zombie. Um but yeah that that I think it does speak to like the, the need of the virus to stay alive and keep spreading no matter what um happens to the host. Mm. Um James, thoughts on Crimson Head Lickers? I love. I know we we've all mentioned it, but I love that uh, zombies have a veteran system. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they have like a nemesis system. It's like they die, but they're gonna come back. You know, they're gonna get the, those two stars. You know, they become. They eventually they're gonna become those SSRs, those super super rares. It's the same guy <laughs> boost in Dragon Ball, only this time there's more blood. <laughs> zombies zombies are, with prestige level. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like zombies are actually just playing real life gacha. You know, 
<laughs> you know they're, they're great i love i love it was it was inspired to bring crimson heads in and i think they should be brought like they should, i think they should be used more and mm. i mean like what's what's what more can you you say about liquors they're so so cool and like unique as a creature i mean their their mechanics and how they work isn't super unique but just that's so iconic like yeah. in this like and how like without they've been uh designed and it make you know i'll go back to something i said earlier on they were they were a part of the mass produced strain so it would make sense that there would be more liquors than there would be of anything else Mm. Um, so it would make sense why we keep seeing liquors everywhere, but man, do I want to see other stuff? Um, yeah, I, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. You know, I, I love liquors. It's hard not to love them because they're part of my favourite game. You know, it's an iconic scene in Resident Evil 2. But yeah, they're a little bit overplayed, which is unfortunate. I talked about the Hunters being the poster boys for Resident Evil in a way, and that's more for us sort of crusty fans that have been here for a long time. Um, the liquors are Chris Pratt, aren't they? They get everywhere. They have the best <laughs> engine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Liquors are the the poster boys of Resident <laughs> Evil, uh, more so than the Hunters and the ty- even a de- absolutely the Tyrants as well. When it comes to um, a more casual mainstream audience that maybe just watch the movies and dip in and out of the games, zombies and liquors are you know almost certainly the things they think of first. So. And, you know, their design speaks to how great they are. Of course, that's the way that it is. But, yeah, it's just a, just a little bit tired. Um, but, yeah, both of them, great designs. And personally, I'm pretty okay with the VAC thing being added in afterwards. It kind of clears up a lot of the... Well, it's in an attempt to clear up a lot of the confusion about the origin of liquors and, you know, were they zombies? Or, you know, is it part of a Pokemon evolution between zombie crimson head and liquor? Um, so I'm a fan of that. It should be. Um, it should be. It Damn should it. be. Well, that's fair enough. Um, okay, we're running a little bit long, but I am going to give a moment now for anyone to shout out any more BOWs that they want to bring up, whether they love or hate. So, Phil, why don't you kick us off? Any more notable T-Virus BOWs for you? Um, I, I think I'm going to stick with what the way, because I've said the Hunters, like my kind of, I think, one of my favourites, along with the liquor, just from what games they're in and like the mm. iconicness. But the worst, we've already mentioned them, but the um, Eliminators, the Baboons in RE0 and um, <laughs> the Hallway Moths in Code Veronica, I just, I can't think of anything that's worse than either of those two. <laughs> Praise the Moth, etc. <laughs> um, <laughs> James, any BOWs you want to give a shout out to T-Virus wise? Uh... <laughs> I had such trouble with this one, but I think like Hunters, yeah, specifically remake three Hunters. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, because they are they are so much more bulkier and terrifying, and I know they can put more resources into it because it's a newer game, right? And they really did well with those guys. But yeah, um, I don't, <laughs> even though a lot of other people did, and. I know other people think they're goofy like I do. I think uh, I think Hunter Gammas are kind of goofy and silly, but like, yeah, like just uh, MM one two one hunters are freaking awesome, and yeah, they they're my best. My least favorite, and this is from the yeah, this has been from Resi one to five. So this is one I had real pro- trouble with because I don't know what would be my least favorite, mm. like to like go up against really um is it i suppose tyrants actually mm, wow. like Fair enough. i i just don't like them like they're <laughs> not like they're just and it's not because they're terrifying to go up against but out of all the things here like they intimidate me the least mm. and that is not that is i'm not i'm, I'm talking about the original games here really because RE2 remake and RE3 remake kind of turned everything on its head a little bit, right? But yeah, I don't find them super intimidating for me, so I, I don't. Yeah, so they would they would be at the bottom. But it's a it's a close tail. It's a close one with zombies, just generic mm. zombies. Mm. I've uh, shouted out my favorite in a way, and again the reason Chimera because they're so disgusting. I've never watched uh, the Fly. Um, I feel like I probably enjoy it in a sense, but also I'm deep, deeply 
unsettled by the concept and just what I've seen of it of this one guy succumbing to that is just incredibly off-putting so I think about that when I see the chimeras and it's uh yeah it gives me the willies not a fan but also in that way a fan I think they're fantastic um in terms of the disappointing ones there's probably a few what the hell is the albanoid just wanted to put that out there um, <laughs> oh, man. it's the it um, tried of BOWs <laughs> I do want to give a shout out to we- a weird one uh, because I played Survivor recently. The UT Trooper, the Undertaker, the Sweeper, the Cleaner, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. Bizarre things. Not humans, but they act like humans. They're like the artificial frogman. humans. They make panther sounds for some reason and they melt when you kill them. They are just bizarre. Not really well explained at all. They never will be. We'll never go back to them, but they stand out. They are the sore thumb of the T-Virus. Oh, also, while we're here, of course, someone has to say Frog Boys. So Frog Boys, they're great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Steve, best and worst of the T-Virus? Okay. Uh, I, they're not best or worst, but I feel like it would be remiss not to shout them out. I feel like the hmm. Snatchers need a shout. You know, they're, yeah. They're iconic in their own way. They're on some CV box art on some CV stuff you know, around there, and I think they're kind of neat. Not personally my favorite, but they need lip service, and they're getting it. There you go. Uh, worst is easily the uh, the OG Leech Man. I, I find it stupid, uh, insipid. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I wish I could talk about you know the analytics and everything else. You know, the idea of leeches doing the whole perfect mimicry thing, followed by a weird leech monster thing, and in the case of the Queen Leech being uh, sentient and capable of thought to that degree, is ridiculous in the Resident Evil universe. Up until that point, it was a shark jump moment. I feel like, and uh, awkward to fight. You need to literally have a weapon on hand to deal with them if you want to do it efficiently in the Molotov cocktails or flame grenades. Uh, I hate them. I, I despise them. Uh, mm. My shout out otherwise is one that I'm not even sure is T, but I think it believe it is, uh, is the Nyx bioweapon from Outbreak Files yes. to the end of the road. This yes, it is. giant, the thing-like thing that absorbs all living mass and has a giant glowing weak spot, yes, but is disgusting and I wish it appeared again. It just looks neat, is horrifying, and it can eat you in one go. Um, <laughs> yeah, it literally looks like something out of H.P. Lovecraft. It's yes, disgusting. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's wrap this up with one last sort of go-around question, I guess. Um, just to sum it up, I suppose, what do you feel is the impact of the T-Virus on the series? Of course, it's massive. We don't really have Resident Evil without it. So I guess more the question is, how do we feel about the series moving away from the T-Virus? Do we think it was a good thing or a bad thing? Um, Phil, you're the guest. Why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, How do you feel about the impact of the T-Virus? And not, I wouldn't say the hole that it's left. That seems a bit loaded. But how do you feel about it since we've moved on? I think, I mean, um, I mentioned earlier about kind of zombie uh, media kind of reflecting the anxieties of the time and all this sorts of stuff and I think um, it, it's not necessarily bad but it's interesting that kind of all the post 9-11 Resident Evil games moved away from fighting corporate spills in the backyard of small town America to going and fighting terrorists over in foreign countries um, mm. and, and that kind of reflected moving away from the T-Virus to all these things like your parasites and everything else. Um, which, again, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, and I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting stuff that um, the likes of RE4 did, as much as the one gripe I have about it is that they killed off Umbrella off-screen and kind of hand-waved away that whole plot. But, mm. um, yeah, we would, as you say, we wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have RE without the T-Virus, and I think as much as there's plenty of reasons to like that sort of RE4 onwards era. I'm always going to be kind of tied to the T-Virus era and the PlayStation 1 era and, and that original trilogy because I think that everything that the T-Virus created was obviously horrible, cost lots of lives, but also gave me hours of fun as a kid, so there's <laughs> a balance there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, James, same question. How do you feel about uh, the T virus now that I guess in theory it's it's kind of done, it's wrapped. Yeah, it's it's sad because like I I yeah I don't think they're gonna kind of revisit again unless it's gonna be in quite a long a long ways down the line. Um, I think there might be a plan in place 
um, to go down another avenue. Mm. But this is Capcom. They, yeah, I, they, Capcom, I feel like are like, you know, hunters and chimeras. They are chaos, like in terms <laughs> of their lore and where they go. Mm. I would like to see T Virus come back. Um, and just to, it'd be nice to have a soft reboot of some kind. Maybe another trilogy would be cool. Yeah. Um, for a, a new age of T Virus leading into other, or maybe it's not even called T Virus, it's just called right, something sure. else, but you know. Yeah, I'd like to see that again because this is so much possibilities that you could do and they just went a little bit silly with it mm. um, when they could have just, you know, kept to their initial ideas and just, yeah, you know, yeah, because some of these, like, offshoot games are a bit silly, like, with how they've dealt with the with the, with the T-Virus. Um, so, yeah, just be a little bit smarter in the future if they do bring it back, but I, uh, it's sad, but I don't, I don't think it will be. Uh, in our near future anyway yeah it's I don't know there's parts of me that feels like it's a l- kind of realistic that they went the route they did where it's on the black market and it gets reiterated and combined with other things into being all these other crazy stuff like there is some realism to that but also it's a fantasy world and you could have stopped that from happening and, and kept things kind of small of that you know that's obviously not what they wanted to do um, so I take no issue with what they've did, of course. I'm not saying that anyone else does either. Uh, but, you know, we've been crying for a long time for what 7 and 8 did, in a sense, and kind of bring things to a more contained situation or series of situations. Um, and, of course, they reinvented things with the Plagas and the Mold, and that's all well and good. But it would be interesting to see them return to And I agree, it probably wouldn't be the T-Virus. That would be a kind of a step back, law-wise. It can't really be the T-Virus anymore. Um, but something along those lines would be nice. I think it's probably time, and we are in a state now with the law where it is probably time for a new trilogy or something else. Because I, th- I guess maybe the mold stuff is over, and if it isn't over now, it almost certainly will be after Resident Evil Nine. I think, uh, like the Plaga stuff kind of wrapped up too. So yeah, it'd be nice for them to head back to a classic viral agent sphere for me maybe kick off a new virus that does a similar thing and creates new monsters and new strains that we can do a podcast episode about in 10 years time <laughs> um steve uh, how do you feel about the t-virus effects on resident evil i think the fact that it's got such a massive history and that, that there are iteration upon iteration upon iteration gives it a lot more weight than say the mold g t veronica the C virus, all of these other ones don't have quite as much history. Even the, the central thrust narratively, the the, uh, the the progenitor virus, as it turns out, which basically becomes a form of Ouroboros, right? Or Ouroboros mm. becomes a form of it. Like, you yeah. know, T is the big one. And I feel like, I, I can't point to everybody else, I feel like there is a there is a point where we can look back, you know, as cringe as it is, and it was terrible in the uh, the, the final Skywalk, whatever it was, where somehow Palp- Palpatine returned. If there is just some evil umbrella laboratory buried in the middle of bloody nowhere and someone goes, aha, I have the perfect tea, tea pure or whatever, like someone comes out with a new sexier tea virus, this time it comes in black, I'll be fine with it. <laughs> like, you know, I'll yes, be fine sir. with a new, because we know basically what it does, but we can, it can always find new and interesting ways to improve on people, <laughs> improve on bioweapons at least. Uh, just no pan flutes this time. <laughs> I mean it. Like... I feel like that the, there is it just it doesn't even need to have a new name. I feel like uh, you know if it has the old name, it comes with it the, the old bugbear. Like somehow Palpatine returned, only less. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> and we've come full circle. Um, yeah, I I I would agree certainly. And you know the series has kind of returned with the sense of we have blue umbrella and umbrella core and stuff so it does kind of feel inevitable in its own way so i guess we'll see um we will continue to cover viruses in future episodes obviously really we haven't even talked all about we talked about the various t virus strains but of course there's all the offshoots like abyss like thobos tng veronica and so on Uh, but that's definitely a podcast for another day Nothing else remains for me but to thank our contributors, our Patreons and our listeners. Join the First Day Spray Discord server to become part of our community and hear the show early and unedited. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. All of these links and all of our content can be found at faspraypod.com. You can listen to the podcast
podcast on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and all good podcasting apps. And if you like what you hear, please do leave us a review where you can and spread the good word. Don't forget you can support the show by picking up some merch or at patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for as little as $1 a month. In our next episode, providing we're not covering the demo, but watch this space, we'll be arriving by car and presumably leaving by boat as we explore a reimagined not Spain as the release of Resident Evil 4 Remake is nearly at hand. Join us for our immediate reaction. Thank you to the panel. You can follow all of us individually. I'm at Siniac underscore 123. Steve is at FB. Steve was taken. James is at Moist Owl at OFF. And Phil is at AK Black and Red. And finally, thank you for listening and have a good week. I'm at Siniac underscore one, two, three. Steve is at FB. Steve was taken. Join. <laughs> Joins. Joins. Sub to Phil. <laughs> Joins. a thousand subs. I just want to say it again. What? Sub, oh, yeah. Sub to Phil. Get him a thousand subs. Uh, yeah. Wait. <laughs>